Hey, this is Glenn Rogers, guitarist of Primal, Deliverance, and former member of Heretic, and you're experiencing Poppet's Corner. Okay. What's going on, guys? Episode four here. I got my main man, Sherman, so we're going to start this broadcast, and, uh, Thanks so much for tuning in, all right? Hello, everybody. All right, dude. Here we go. How you doing, my man? Thanks I'm so much well. for the opportunity, by the way. You know what? The pleasure is mine. Thank you. And on behalf of Gimme, myself, and the band, we commend you for doing this. Nobody out there is doing anything like this right now. We believe in what right you Right now do. and not ever, dude. Yeah, well, look at here. Bad boy, to you. We believe in what you do, and we we're gonna sponsor you in what you do. I we're gonna spread the word, that, and I do I do it for for us, dude. Okay. This is not only my show, but this is this is this is our show, dude. Right. Like this is yeah. You'll see in a minute why. But uh, basically, what the format of this show is, it's kind of like I've said it many times, mm -hmm. but I want to just sure. reiterate if you haven't seen the show before. Um, it's kind of like inside the actor studio. I love I, that show. Uh, yeah, it's a great show. But I wanted to take that concept and, like, interview somebody, a one-on-one -on -one conversation mm -hmm. with, like, his entire career, as opposed to, like, just the band he's in. Got it, got it. You know it. what I mean? So you've done, like, a couple things mm -hmm. here and there. So I wanted to uh, get more feedback, and, and you can elaborate, obviously, you know. Yeah, no worries. If, uh, if I miss something, please, like, just step in, you know. I saw on the Facebook where you said, oh, we're going to interview Sherman, Sex Society, and the entire career, and I started, started thinking about it. It's like, wow, a career. I never really looked at it as a career. It was like, this is what we do because we're into the scene. Right. It's it's a lifestyle. It's for the love of music. And, yeah, some people might think it's work, but anything you do that's fun, you don't doesn't, you don't really look at it at work. Yeah, sure, you got to go to rehearsal and this and that. You got to deal with a bunch of crap or whatever, but the rewards are, are much more. The people you meet, the satisfaction of doing something, being creative. Meeting people such as yourself and remaining friends with people over years, and you know, I'm, I know we got a couple hours, but uh, I was going to try and do things chronologically, and it's just like, oh, absolutely, that's what the whole point is. Show. I'm going to go chronologically, and if I miss something, please step in and got it. and and fill me in. So there's there's you have three main groups, right? There's a band called Eyeball, mm -hmm. a band called obviously Hyrax. Mm -hmm. For the, the, you know, yeah. out there, yeah. very short, very short stint, and then uh, obviously you know insecticide. Uh -huh. Right there. So, and the newest thing I started doing a couple years ago, but I put that on, uh, I put that on hiatus, was Sherman's Tank. Uh, that's we'll that's awesome. That. Yeah, that sounds like a that sounds like a cool pod podcast name. Oh, well, thank you, By thank the way, you, thank you. Food for thought there. It was uh, it was supposed to be my my own solo band. Once Insecticide is no longer doing what we do, which is performing live, and you know sometimes life takes precedent. You get wives, you get girlfriends, you get grandkids, you get kids, and uh, you know you don't rehearse as much as you used to. You're not doing as many gigs. You're more choosy and on what you're going to, what shows you're going to play. Uh, they come few and far between. I figured, well, you know, I enjoy playing. Mm -hmm. I enjoy I enjoy the creative process the most, and I, mean, I need to do something. That, that's what makes it worth it. Yeah, like seriously, mm -hmm. that's really what makes our careers. Mm -hmm. Sorry, careers. Yeah. To me, I'm like you. I don't never think of it like a career, but that's what makes it worth it in the end. Is yeah. it's just making not only yourself happy. It's it's always awesome too to see like the, uh, your fans' reactions mm -hmm. as well. Like, mm -hmm. I've always felt uh, going somewhere else where complete strangers come up to you and they're they're generally enjoying your music compared to a a friend who tells you how great you were, or whatever, whatever, whatever they're going to say. Coming from a stranger and say, "Hey, I, I love the drum beat," or "Oh, wow, that song you did, the song title, or, or what you what you what you're singing about is great." That's more rewarding than just a guy I've known for 15 years is hanging out with the band, and, and and he likes it as a fan, but a stranger that can actually get in, into your frame of mind with the band and say, "I like that." Well, it's because you're friends; you've known them for 15 years. Yeah. Like you don't know these these complete strangers that come up mm -hmm. to you and and I. The, the main thing too is it's like well we never think that like 
we were reaching anybody, but then when you get that stranger that mm-hmm. just comes up, like it makes it all worth it. You kind of yep. forget that like you, the music you created has like left you know an impression on mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool. Hey, before we get started, on behalf yeah, sir. of uh, looking at your podcast, see where it has on behalf of the band, we we like to have to give oh, you this, dude. We like to give you that, dude. Thank you so no much. Worries. Seriously, man, no worries. I'm gonna actually wear this now if you. All don't right, know. no, no, no. So, that's from Gimme and myself. I appreciate this. And, this is uh, amazing, dude. A couple years ago when we started doing our... Uh, oh, and it's comfortable. All right. It's a comfortable hat. Make sure <laughs> yeah. to go get one, dude. A couple years ago when... I know we're going to get the story, but... Um, mm-hmm. uh, when we There's start, a lot of stories. Right? Uh, yes, there is. When we started celebrating our 30, if you look at the hat, it says established 1986. It's kind of around the time. You know, Gimme and I have been buddies for a long, long time prior to 86, mm-hmm. but, you know, every story has its beginning. Right. It's usually high school or middle school or something. In, it was right around in there. Yeah. So tell me, what was the first project that you uh, that you got into around in the eighties? Like, what was your first band? Well, see, that's what's. There's a lot of inner circle stuff happening here, but if I just start from the real beginning, please, you know, since it's a, the career. <clears throat> I was thinking about this when I was about six years old. My parents got divorced, and my mom remarried, mm-hmm. and that gentleman had uh, teenagers. So I'm six, now thrown into a Brady Bunch sort of family, and those 15, 16 year olds had the Woodstock album, Led Zeppelin albums, things like that. You know, I, I had the sort of the Sesame Street records and stuff like that. I was naturally drawn to it, maybe because I look up to these guys and they have long hair, and you know, this is going to be my family now. So I was drawn towards, you know, the Led Zeppelin, the Black Sabbath, this and that. And the kid across the street from me, he had an older brother. And, he had Black Sabbath albums, Deep Purple albums. And it, I don't know, did I want to emulate these guys? Yeah, maybe, probably. Um, and then as the years went on, you, you find more harder stuff. You know, you find the ACDC. You find the Judas Priest. Remember, there's not metal at this time. It's well, hard rock. Well, what year is it, though? Oh, you, this you, have to, you have to, when you, uh, when you start, obviously, tell me a year, definitely. Like, tell 1971, me 72. Wow. Now I'm in fourth grade, 1976, and you know Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin are very fluent with us. Right. Uh, one of and my and they're kids, still playing live back yeah, in the yeah, days too. Yeah. But I'm not going to these concerts. I'm, no, I'm too but, young. but that's yeah. That's when the time like that's, absolutely that shows when when you were getting into the band. Yeah, absolutely. They're still playing, and I'm about ten years old. Wow. 1978. I'm in sixth grade. Boston, Van Halen, and Black Sabbath come to L.A. and they're playing the Anaheim Convention Center. You know, obviously I can read the newspaper. I know they're coming. I can't go. That's the way it goes. Um, It was uh, eighth grade. We had an elective class and there was a buddy of mine and he played guitar and his brother played guitar. He said, hey, come here, play guitar with me. He's like, I don't know how. He said, just come here, I'll just show you a few things. He showed me a couple chords, and we were playing, and people started gathering around us, and I just kept a real simple rhythm, things that he had taught me, Mm -hmm. and people were gathering around us, gawking and staring, and we were having a good time. That summer, my dad said to me, what do you want to do this summer? You know, I pay pay, pay, uh, for basketball camp for your brother, we do all this stuff, he's all, but you never do anything. And I said, well, I would like to go to a concert. And he's all, all right, what do you want to go to? And I said, Black Sabbath is coming. And he's all, gave me that kind of like, hmm, all right. But the catch was my brother had to go and his friends had to go. So my dad went out and he, he bought, I don't know, 10, 12 tickets for all of us to go to this concert. We went there overnight and we slept. And when we got to the Coliseum, we had to go find a phone booth to call my dad to tell him that we were there safely. And so my first major experience in a huge concert was Black Sabbath. Already it's coming to full circle. It's like, wow, this is what I love and this is what I'm seeing. After that, I started catching a lot of gigs. So in high school, when I went to high school, uh, my dad took me and we were signing up for our classes and the electives. And my dad wanted me to take an electronics class. But I saw a guitar class. So it's like, I want this. And before my dad could say, no, you're going to take this, I had already signed it. And the angels had sung to me and the light came down over my head and it was just complete, oh. Started a freshman uh, playing a little bit, gu- playing a little bit of guitar. Um, I had saved up. I've always kind of had some sort of odd job pulling weeds or washing cars or something like that. 
I had saved up and I had bought a uh, Burgundy Antares Flying V. Okay. I bought it for about 150 bucks. That's still a lot of money back That's in like 1981 of... and you're washing cars and pulling weeds. <clears throat> I remember getting the guitar and getting it home and getting out the electrical tape and putting stripes on it like Eddie Van Halen. Uh, my record collection is growing now. You know, I'm buying the UFOs, the Judas Priest, things like that. Uh, there was a record store not too far from my house, and I would go and buy records. And uh, I actually bought, at that record store, I bought Quiet Riot with Randy Rhodes. A Japan import. I paid like $2 for it. I'm not sure what happened to it, but I remember not really caring for the album. So I'm in high school, I'm playing guitar, I'm running into some guys... And uh, there was a guy named Mike Slack, and he kind of liked hard rock, too. Well, he had a friend who was a senior who had a car who liked hard rock. Metal's happening, but it's not really metal as, per se, as we know it today. It was just metal. You know, like I heard Angel say, there wasn't thrash, there wasn't death, there wasn't grind. It was just metal. Right. There's, know, there's two kinds. There's yeah. punk and there's metal. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I'm learning about, about the early days, it was just <laughs> punk and metal. You yeah. either loved punk or uh -huh. you loved metal and that was it yeah yeah uh gimme liked both so you know that's we get our little punk attitude and our rhythm sort of from him and i like it too because you know, i grew up in the south bay and you had you had a black flag and the circle jerks and things like that so um i start playing start learning some songs that everyone else in my school is learning and there was a guy that was getting a band together and they had they were playing judas priest as my iron maiden he's like hey we're looking for a guitar player so I'll come down and audition. I was like, all right, what songs do we need to learn? Do I need to learn? So I, I learned them to the best of my ability. Putting it on the record, cranking up the bass, lifting up the needle, putting it back again. And I'm fairly learning them. I always had a struggle at my things. I was never really good in school. <clears throat> I remember walking to his house with my guitar, no case, practicing the songs. I get to his grandma's garage, and I don't even have an amp. They gave me a little <laughs> amp, don't know how to use it. We go through the songs, and... Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were what? You said eighth grade? No, I was uh, high school? I was about a freshman in high school, so okay. that puts me about 15. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, obviously, I didn't make the cut. So I, I, I remember to this day, walking home, kind of bummed out, but yay, you know, life goes on. And I remember saying to myself, wow, you know, maybe I should just write my own stuff. Do my own stuff. That way, no one knows my mistakes and this and that. So... Started writing some riffs, my own little things, little ditties, nothing major. And never thinking about what was going to happen 34 years down the line, 40 years down the line. But a few years ago, I was thinking, when I was a kid, leaning up against my bed with the headphones on, listening to the Ramones, looking at the album cover, looking at their leather jackets. If some guy would have walked into my room and he says, hey, Sherman, in 35, 40 years... You're going to open up for that drummer down in McAllen, Texas, the very tip of Texas down there. And this guy's going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I would have said, what? Me? Really? What, what's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Really? Where's this place at? Which we actually did a few years ago. That's amazing. And it's just it's one of the things I'll point out later. But uh, then, like I said, I always had some jobs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like all of us. Yeah. I'm flipping burgers one day. A little punk rock kid comes into the burger joint. And I used to wear this guitar pin, and the kid says, hey, you play guitar? I was like, yeah, yeah, I play a little bit. He's all, hey, my brother plays guitar, too. I'm all, really? He said, what do you play? I go, I like metal. He's like, yeah, hey, my brother does, too. And it's like, well, where's he at? And the kid points over to the for my tables, and there's Gimme, Brian, nice. sitting there. So I tell the guy, hey, man, I'm going to talk to this cat real quick. Went over there. He had just moved to my neighborhood. He was living down here in Orange County. Had, his mom was working up in uh, some aerospace, and he moved in with her. And we just had a natural bond of friendship. You know, he liked the same things I liked. Um, he listened to Doctor Metal. I listened to Doctor Metal. When I'd come home from work on a Friday night, I'd go to my room. What is what is Doctor Doctor Metal? Metal was a radio show, and he what station? Uh, what? That was KMET. Okay, uh, station that's no longer around, and he would play Judas Priest, ACDC. You know, anything that was considered maybe heavy metal, hard rock, I listened to Dr. And, metal. And back in the day, nobody played ACDC and... and no, uh, it was a specialty show. Like, nobody played it. No. No. You'd, you'd hear the run of the mill, what was popular at the time. You'd hear your queen. Love queen. Yeah, but. so do I. You'd hear your, 
uh, whatever you know, flavor of the month, the, the My Sharona, the cars, things like that. So uh, Gimme and I became good friends. And one thing I did mention once before, we uh, a few years back we did a, uh, at least I think we did, with the first Storytellers as a heavy metal band. And what I bring from that day, the first day I met Gimme, is my life changed drastically for the better that day because I met him. And we are still friends to this day. Yeah, we have our spats, and we each want to be top dog in the band. And it's my riff. Oh, uh, can I change it real quick? Well, why don't you learn it right first? And you know, sometimes he carries the band, and he, he carries me. Sometimes I come up with the riffs, and I hey, let's just play this real quick, and let's just see how it goes. So you know, you're in a band. You know, you know how it goes. All the yeah. What I always say, you know, let's do what's best for the song, not not what's Absolutely. best for the ego. Absolutely. Uh, if my idea sucks and yours is better, we'll use that. If mine's better, <laughs> we'll use that, you know. Yeah. But, so, uh, yeah, go, so go on. So right. after you met him. Yeah. So in my neighborhood, there was uh, there were some good players. And one of those good players uh, was a guy named Dean Coffey who played bass. And he got into this band called Vermin. <laughs> it, yeah. You mean, you mean, it's uh, a giant circle in that little neighborhood. So if you go to episode three, we mm -hmm. talked to Angelo. Mm hmm Obviously, he was in Vermin. Yeah, absolutely. And he was rooting for him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing Al Angelo around town. But uh, if you look at the back of the Haunting the Chapel album from Slayer, they thank Vermin. Wow. So, anyways, uh, Dean Coffey was a friend of mine, uh, loved heavy metal. And uh, there was this record store we used to go to out in the valley. It was called Oz Records. Have you heard anything of Oz Records? Never. Okay. Well. Educate me. <laughs> all right. I'm going to do that right now. Um. Remember that record store I told you I'd go my records from? I went in there one day, and the guy's all, have you ever heard of Iron Maiden? And I was all, no, no, never heard of him. I kid you not, this dude walks into the record store, long hair, and he's all, hey, mate, this record's got a scratch on it. And when, when your record had scratches, you took it back to the store, and they gave you a new one. This guy was from England, and he was a, a few years older than me, and he had the Iron Maiden now. And I, was, I just started talking to him. We went back to his apartment he lived with his dad his dad made movies and he had bands like diamond head holocaust angel witch and i was like wow this this guy i like this guy and we became friends too but he knew of a place out in the valley in woodland hills and it was called oz records wow. and when i would so-called behave <laughs> my dad would drive me out there and he'd buy me some records well, what a I'm, good dad my of that i said what a good dad yeah i think he uh in was encouraging of what I want to do. I don't think he understood it because he was he was a much older father than the majority of my friends' dads. Um, so we'd got to Oz Records and we'd buy records. But unbeknownst to me at the time, the guy who ran this record store, his name was Brian Slagle. And I would go to this store whenever I would behave on a Sunday or Saturday with my dad driving. And my dad would sit in the car, read the paper, and I would go in. And every now and then, Brian Slagle would come up to me and say, you ever heard these guys? I don't know. He's all, you're going to like this. He, he uh, turned me on to Accept Breaker, Ocean from Germany, Sirithungal, all sorts of these bands. That I couldn't get in my neighborhood. Like, I bought Saxon in my neighborhood, and I, the Iron Maiden album came in. I could, I could get a, a British Steel in my neighborhood. But to get something such as Tank. Like imports? Yeah. This was the place. Buttons, patches. I, that was heaven for me. And that's when I pretty much started wearing a vest. With, how how expensive were records back then? Cause Four ninety nine. Okay. Three ninety nine. Uh, you could buy a record for eight ninety nine, depending on what it was. You know. That was so, an expensive record. Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. You know, and uh, Witch Finder General. I had Witch Finder General on red vinyl with the boobies on the cover, which you don't see that stuff anymore. You probably do, but. You know, well, they're not going to sell it at uh, Best Buy. With, no, yeah. they're not going to sell anything at Best Buy because they don't. Sell, Best Buy doesn't sell anything anymore. They don't sell any music. Uh, so um, Brian Slagle would do these shows every now and then, and they were called. And he also put out a magazine. Uh, was uh, I was on the tip of my tongue. Uh, the new heavy, the new heavy metal review. And I got some copies of that, and he would do these shows called Metal Massacre, and I would go to these things. And there was a couple times after the show. We went, if I remember correctly, he lived, he still lived with his mom, and we'd go to the house, and we'd play heavy metal, and talk to the bands that were there, and, you know, it was, it was, it was like, I was, I belonged to something, and it was like, I wouldn't say it was an exclusive group, but it was like, wow, I'm, I'm with some people, and they were all nice, you know, no one's, 
being a kook and whatnot, I remember going into Brian Slagle's room and from the floor to the ceiling, TDK tapes, immaculate, a collection of just stuff and stuff and stuff. The only other person I ever came across in my life that had a collection like that is when we were in D.C. and we were hanging out with deceased. We went to King Fowley's house. This guy. Oh, he's awesome, You talk awesome, about a dude. guy who has everything and knows everybody's name. And I have a fairly good memory, but I can't remember the drummer's name and this and that. But, I, you know, depending on how well of a friendship we incur, I might remember that. But uh, getting back to in the early 80s, meeting up with Gimme and trying to form a band. The first time we ever got together, we wrote a song together. So anyways. What was that song? It was called Funky Lady. <laughs> I met a funky lady. Dun, 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 dun. It's she like a smile tap that 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 you just re Yeah, kind of. Hey, man, you know what? We were just having fun <laughs> in his mom's kitchen, sitting there playing these ditties, I'll call them. Well, anyways, it came about a point where a band called Hans Crypt... The Upsetters. Oh, man. Hans Crypt. I think they're still around. Yeah, but this was the original, original Hans Crypt. And Vermin were doing a show at this place called Normandale Park in our neighborhood not too far away. And remember, I went to school with Dean Coffey, who was the bass player for Vermin. Mm -hmm. I pestered that guy and pestered that guy to get on the bills. Finally, I guess he just gave in. And he let me and Gimme open the show. Here's the thing. We didn't have a band. We had to go find a drummer and a bass player. We called ourselves Bloodlust, and we played three original songs. The joke of that gig is the bass player that we that we had wore a jumpsuit, and he never jumped once. I had smashed a guitar at that show. Remember Brian Slade? We used to do those metal massacres. Uh huh. Well, I went to one that featured Bitch. I was up front. David Carruth brought out this piece of crap Telecaster, smashed it, and when the show was over, I just I just grabbed all the pieces and walked out with them, put nail in it, and. We were at the gig, and I was going to smash this guitar, and I was going to light it on fire. I had, I had uh, lighter Some fluid. kerosene. Yeah, I was ready to go. And they're all, hey, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm going to light this thing on fire. And they're all, no, you're not. It's like, okay, well, I didn't. But I ended up smashing. What I do remember distinctly from that gig is my mom had come to the gig because she wanted to watch us play. And she got, I don't know, she was late. We only really played three songs. And she but... never came to a show again. Yes, she did, matter of <laughs> fact. She came to when we opened up for Saxon. But That's amazing. But uh, she had walked in as I was smashing my guitar, and uh, if you ever met my mom, you'll know how confused she can get at times because <laughs> the language barrier. She thought I was smashing my flying. <laughs> so the one you bought for 150 bucks. Yeah, absolutely, like absolutely. She thought I was smashing that one, which was I was smashing a piece of junk. But the guy who introduced us at that show was Angelo. Wow. I, one of the first times I remember seeing Angelo was he was walking around with like a Chinese robe with a dragon on the back. And I was all, man, that dude's cool. And I've known Angelo for a long time. Check out this story real quick. I'm going to go away in the future. A few years back, I was getting some work done on my bass. And mm -hmm. I went to go pick it up. And I, I see this guitar case, bass case, and it has an Angel Witch sticker on it. And I was all, I need to know who owns that guitar. Because this guy, I need to talk to him because we like the same stuff. So I go to the guy who runs the shop. And I say, dude, I need to know who owns that case over there. He's all right, let me look it up. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious. I want to meet this guy. All right, cool. You know, probably someone new in the neighborhood. I'm going to pick his brain. Maybe we'll get something rolling. Right. It was Angelo. <laughs> he gave me the number of Okay, I don't, I'm good. All right. Oh, it was just, I thought it was just somebody, somebody new, somebody new in the neighborhood. It was Angelo. So. But, uh, just so, Angelo? Yeah, just Angelo. <laughs> I, he's actually in my in my phone, and I have him uh, labeled. Oh, I know. We almost called you last time. Last oh, week. I wish you would have. Oh, coconut tea, sir. I would have gave you that answer. <laughs> oh, I guess that was the venue, Angel, if you're watching. <laughs> that was uh, the venue that uh, you were talking about. Uh, right? Absolutely. That's where we played with Fear Factory, but that's later in the future. That's so getting back to Bloodless, so Gimme and I, uh, we're doing this Bloodless thing. We're writing all our own original stuff, and things didn't pan out. Gimme uh, went and jammed with some guys out in Highland Park, and they were called Wicked. And uh, around that time, I had stopped doing the Bloodlust thing, and I had now changed the band's name to Maniacs, the Masters of Death. It was M-A-N-I-A-X-E, and I wore an axe around my neck. So we what year was, were all these projects? That this was master. probably 80, uh, eight, late 82, 83, around 84. And... Uh, so I was doing the Maniacs thing, and Gimme was doing his his Wicked thing, and 
you know, Maniacs didn't pan out, Wicked didn't pan out, Give Me Not, you know, we're jamming it. He actually brought me into Wicked to see, uh, get another guitar player. Really wasn't my style, but they had a singer, and the guy's name was Norman, and he was really into King Diamond. So Gimme and I are That's getting, awesome, dude. He, he, you know what? He was he was a decent singer. Uh, just, you know, just didn't pan out. So Gimme and I are uh, working together again, and we're coming up with some names, and we come across a singer, and his name is Scythe Mace. And he wants to call his band Scythe Mace after him. The Scythe that the Reaper carries, and a mace, the ball with the spikes on it. That's him. It's like, okay. Well, we got to compromise here because Gimme and I are in the band, even though it's, it's like Lizzie Board. So we became Scythe Mace, the Tools of Death. And Gimme and I were the Tools of Death. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a long name, dude. <laughs> That's a long name for a band, even like back in back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, Maniacs, the, the Masters of Death. And, and we weren't even, it was just straight heavy metal. Kind of, kind of you know, kind of Iron Maiden because that one was in at the moment. So, um, we got this drummer who used to be in, I don't know if you remember, like a punk band from the 80s, and they were called the Weasels. And then their famous song was Beat Your Mother with a Rake. We got that drummer, and we were playing with him. So we were auditioning uh, bass players. Mm -hmm. Here's one story. I, I got to tell it really quick. And I'm, totally. I'm, I'm even going to tell this dude's name. So we're auditioning bass players, and uh, I'm the guy that has a little bit more patience, I guess. And I'm the guy that says, hey, let's, this is how the song goes. I'm the teacher. Gimme would sit back and noodle around on his guitar. So this guy walks into the audition, and his name is Robert Hernandez. He's got long hair. He's got a leather trench coat on. He came walking in with his bass case, and he had myth spray painted on it. Rolling. Wow. It never dawned on us that we could spray paint our name on our cases. <laughs> so the guy, you Unless know. you want them stolen. That's why I don't <laughs> do it online. Yeah, you know? I, yeah someone's going to walk off with your crap. That's why I don't, that's why I don't do it. So this guy, uh, he's ready to play, and I go up to him, and I said, okay, man, we're going to do this song. It was called uh, Into Battle Thoughts of War. Intro, then I get the guy, and then the song. I go to the guy, and I show him the piece, and you, you could tell the guy was good. You could tell the guy would play, and he's all, all right, all right, and I'm, okay, this, then here, and then, you know, we'll take it up here. If we get lost, we'll stop, you know, just making the guy feel comfortable. we got to be bros. It's going to reflect in your music if you're bros or not. If you don't like the guy, uh, you're going to argue. Right? And, and, and the lifespan of the band is going to be two years, and you're going to start all over again. All that money you spend on merchandise, whatever, this and that, uh, demo tapes out the window. Friends the before the band, dude. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, give me an eye. 30-something years, friends before that. But uh, So we're jamming with this guy, and we go into the song. We, we, we start the song, we kick into it. And remember, this guy could really, really play. So as soon as we kick into the meat of the song, the guy's all... It's like, wow, this guy's really, really good. But it's like, stop, 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 stop. It's like, hey, bro, the song goes like this. Whatever the riff is. Right. And he's all, oh, okay, all right, all right. So, hey, Jim from Buzz, start the song. We go into the song. And like... He's overcompensating. Yeah, himself, do you not dude. hear the, the? You're not even playing the song. You're all over. So that was in, right? Everyone wanted to be Steve Harris. Uh, everyone wants to be Rudy Sarzo, right? Oh, dude. Yeah. yeah. But the They're, problem is, is like they do what's best for the song. They don't do what's best for <laughs> for them. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So we stopped the song, and I said, "Hey, man, the song goes like this." Now, I'm not a very tall guy, so everyone's taller than me. This guy looks away from me, closes his eyes, and he says. I know everything. Gimme told me what happened next. I just blocked out. I, I don't remember what happened. So Gimme says, I said, do you know you're not in this band? All right. So around that time, we're auditioning bass players. Uh, we're, you know, we're doing the size mate thing. Mm -hmm. I get hit by a car. Oh, no. Yeah, I got hit by a car. So And I busted my thumb. And that you, was... You, wait, wait, wait. You, bust, you, you only busted your thumb? Only busted my hit? thumb. Yeah. What did you do? Stick out your thumb and have a car hit it? Uh, I was on a scooter with a hitchhiker on the back, and I got sideswiped with a guy in, who was in a uh, uh, Porsche. Oh, my god! And as I flipped over the handlebars, I busted my thumb, and I flipped, and my head hit the curb. That was the night we were all going to go see uh, Metallica at the Palladium with uh, Armored Saint. Oh. Needless to say, I missed that game. So why I have a cast on my hand, um, we had... Uh, we had lost the bass player that we had, that we had found. And then it was like one of those things is like, Gimme just said, hey, dude, why don't you just play bass till we actually 
find a bass player, bass player. It's like, all right, you know what? We get to keep moving. We play, and you know, it's kind of one of those things. Like, well, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Let me just. I'm not a bass player, so I'm, I'm playing bass. And I bought Dean Coffee from Vermin's Bass, which I still have today, which is a BC Rich Mockingbird, solid body. What year? 1981. Okay. So it's made in America. I hear it's worth some money, and I still play this day. I've okay, had it's half a dozen money, jobs. As long as you still play it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've bought a few other bases, and I'm probably going to phase this one out because uh, some of the lacquer is starting to chip where the horn is. And it's like, ah, uh, you know. Especially if I go somewhere, like on a plane or whatever, I'd rather just take something that if something were to happen to it, I can say, okay, it is what it is instead of my prized possession, which is this Black Mockingbird BC Rich. Yeah, I understand. I have I have the the guitar I play at every, every show you see at. I'm want to retire that thing so I can fucking get a new one uh -huh. so I'm not having to like worry about my prize possession being uh -huh. stolen or something. Uh -huh. And I, I've had I work it. done it over the years. You know, like I said, Fred Jobs, things like that. Uh, plates and stuff. Pots have gone bad. Uh, uh, the, the material that kept the pickups up had rotted out so now I got like more heavy duty foam under there to raise up the uh, raise up the strings. I've changed the bridge. I got a badass on it. I've changed everything from, uh, from chrome to gold. You know, just, just a little creature habit of comfort things for me. So Gimme and I are doing the, uh, uh, we're doing the guitar player, bass player thing now. Mm -hmm. And then while we were doing that, we kind of just figured out that the Psych Mace guy really wasn't working anymore for us. So now we're down to ourselves. And it's working, obviously. It's, it's you know, it's, it's just me and him, and we, we're, we're go, kind of going through a drummer, and okay, what's going to happen next? And uh, it was just like one of those things where he, says, he said, hey, uh, oh, you know what, L let me backtrack a little bit. Because remember that guy that sounded like King Diamond? We had him on our first insecticide demo. And uh, I'm playing bass. Gimme's on the guitar. We have a singer. And Mike Chacon, which is the drummer for Vermin and LSN, is on our demo. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Okay, well, he's, he's on there. So... Um, that phased out. Gimme says to me, hey, man, maybe you should just kind of sing to it, like get a singer. So I'm kind of the bass player of the band by default. I'm the singer of the band by default. I'm not a singer. I just, you know, uh, Tom Petty and Bob Dylan are great singers, but it works for what they're doing, kind of like what we're doing. So we had had a couple drummers that came in and out. Uh, nothing really worth, worth mentioning because as long as you didn't really record anything with us, we just keep the ball rolling. Um... Around this time, you know, things can get heavy and heated. Gimme and I decide, well, you know what, let's just, you should go do that, and I'm going to go do this. Gimme got into a band called EOM, which was called Ethics, Ethics of Madness. Remember at that time, everyone was doing a SOD or some, some sort of three-letter mm -hmm. kind of band. Well, he did Ethics of Madness, which was EOM. And he had a drummer in this band, a great uh, bass player and a uh, phenomenal guitar player. And I was kind of left by myself. Which is fine. I'm searching around. Do you remember the band Detente from the '80s? Yeah, Don Crosby. Don Crosby. Yeah. Oh man. Well, at one time and she went on to Fear of God. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Fear of God. Fear yeah. God. We were all kind of in the same building at one time. Megadeth, Abattoir, Neil Turbin was there. LSN was upstairs. Uh, Angela was there a few years later, I think, with his band Seed. For some reason, I thought he was in a band called Boyle. Is that true? Angelo, no, let me no, know. no, no. He was no, 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 no. He was. We we established. A, I think he filled in for a band called Hunger. Okay. Which was in the nineties. All right. Well, yeah, we had we had fucked up the band name. So right. yeah, that was that was my fault. <laughs> when he brought up Decentral, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. But uh, so we're all in this building together, and uh, I was friends with Don. She's very one of my f absolute favorite vocalists, I think, ever. Oh really? Yeah. All right. More chick singers. I wish had personality. I wish had more personality like that. In their she voice. she was very approachable person. Uh, you learn things from people over the course of the years, and such as being like her, being very approachable. It's one of those things where like, you say to yourself, "I'm going to emulate that. That's what I want to do." But uh, I was walking in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and we started talking, and she said, "Hey, Sherman, uh, Hyrax is looking for a bass player." It's like, ah, I'm not a huge Hyrax fan, and. And yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna you say play, you play this like the same style. Yeah, to <laughs> to, a, to an extent. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna say what I say. I'm, I'm not. I wasn't fond of the vocals on, on those two albums. I'm just not. It's good stuff. You know, I'm, it's all good too. People yeah. to each their own. Yeah. You know. And she said, "Kate's not in the band." 
And I said, oh, all right, well, let me get the number. So I called up the original guitar player, who was Scott, Scott Owen. Owen, and at that time they had Eric Red. Okay. From DRI. On the on, on the, the vocals. No, on drums. No, that was that was his brother, right? That's Kurt. Yeah. Oh, okay. Er, yeah. Eric's his yeah, yeah. Kurt's brother Eric. Yeah, right. Eric Kurt, right. Kurt's brother Eric on drum. Impeccable drumming. Hell of a nice guy. Uh didn't play with a lot of fury. But his timing was impeccable. Well, yeah, Hate Fair and Power is like it's obviously a record that's it's yeah. great. Album. But you know, once I, you, I told you what I thought about it, but yeah. it is what it is. So she gave me Scott's number. I called up Scott, and he said, uh, "Hey, come on down, and uh, you know, let's, let's see how things go." So I was familiar with some high rack stuff, but like I said, I wasn't really a fan. Fan, you know, I didn't own Raging Violence or whatever, but you know, I I knew of the album. Things now like they're that. considered classics. Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, like absolutely. My buddy in Albuquerque. Kirky called me a, a month or so ago, and he said, "Hey man, I was just watching Mama's Family, and there's some punk band on there, and they use that album cover as, as the, uh, the punk band." Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Check it out. I think they were called uh, uh, the Splatterheads or something like that. I might have to ask uh, Kate that. Yeah, That's... do that. It's, it's, it's on an episode of Mama's Family, and they hold up hate, they hold up uh, Raging Violence. That's but awesome. But it's, it's under some other name. So um, <clears throat> I go down to Scott's house, and. Uh, he was all, you know, we, he was a nice guy talking, and he just, and he said to me, he said, if you can play this song, you're in the band. I was like, oh, all right, well, you know, okay. And it turned out to be Bombs of Death. And it's like, okay, this works for me because I have the Metal Massacre compilation. Metal Massacre 7, yeah. uh -huh. right? I'm, yeah, I'm fairly familiar with the song. It doesn't sound too complicated. And as anything, I just said, well, Play it first, and then let's go over the parts real quick, you know. And then, as he's playing, I'm watching. But oh yeah, this stuff's pretty easy. It's nothing really too intricate. A lot of a lot of runs or whatever. So I worked my way through it, and then he just said, "You're in the band." I said, "Oh, all right, well that that was easy." And then uh, I had to go back and learn stuff like capital punishment, things like that, things that Angela were saying. And uh, they started playing at my rehearsal hall in in uh, L.A. Didn't last very long. They had a tendency to like not show up sometimes and this and that. So, and then obviously you had no, you didn't record with. Them. No, I did not. I did not. It was just I was the fill in for Gary and kind of Caton in a sense. But um, they wanted a singer. And I said, Hey, I know a guy. So I called uh, Tony Vargas, who is the singer for LSN. So okay. Tony Vargas came in and sang for a little bit. And around that time, it's just, things weren't going well. It's like I need to get out of this project. You know, it's you know, it's not it's not really what I want to do. And I, you know, these guys would be better without me. Gimme calls me up one night. He's all, hey man, let's go get some beers. You yeah, go hang out. And I'm like, ah, nah, whatever. And he quirks me somehow to go out and party. And he's with his drummer, Sean from EOM, Sean Hill. Sean Hill died about eight years ago in oh, Chicago. No. He was uh, he was in a tribute. He was in that Aerosmith Pump band. I think it was Pump that did the circuit as Aerosmith. Okay. He always had a heart problem as a little kid, and uh, anyways, he 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 passed away about eight years ago. But he was hanging out with him, and uh, so we're hanging out in the bar, and then Gimme got up, go get some beers or whatever, and Sean goes, uh, "Hey man, we we should jam." And I was like, ah, well, you know, I'm not really doing nothing right now. I, I just to get him off my back, I kind of said, ah, I don't, I don't know any songs, anyways. And he's all, no, let's play some insecticide songs. And I was like, what? How did you get the name insecticide? Oh. You got, you kind of got to back up a little bit. Oh, yeah, now, I do. So. That, huh? Gimme hates this story. I hope you're listening, Gimme. Uh, <laughs> he hates this story. This is true. This is a true story. Um, right out of high school, I got a job in a hardware store. Okay. And my boss always said, read all the products and read all the stuff and know the stuff because people are going to ask you questions. You know, so I'd, I'd read products about the paint, you know, how much titanium dioxide was in the paint, and muriatic acid, oh, and don't get it in your eyes. I read all that crap. We got this new product in one day. It was called, and this is funny, the product is called Enforcer. Remember that? Called Enforcer. So, you know, I'm in the back room and I'm reading the product and it says on there, this promises to be the world's finest insecticide. Now, hmm. And I looked at it. Gimme hates the story, but it's the truth. And I'm looking at it, and I'm all insecticide. And I, there's 11 letters in here. There's a T in the middle. What? I like that. So I went back. And I, hey, gimme, what do you think about insecticide? He said, nah. Well, all right, we'll come up with something else. But I, I liked it. 
and I had written it on my car. I had a little fairing on the back of my orange Pinto, <laughs> and I had my buddy spray paint insecticide, squiggly. Didn't explode on you, hopefully. No, no, no. And I wrote it on my jacket. And then about that time, I, grew, I glued some flies right here. You know, went to the party store, got some flies from the whatever. And uh, I think Jimmy just kind of naturally just f flowed with it. You know, because we, we tossed some other names around. You know, one of them was Ogre, you know. And, but just in sector, I don't know, it just came. And it kind of just worked with what we were doing because even though him and I are like kind of goofballs, and we like to have fun up there, and we really don't take ourselves serious. The music, our musical content, and our lyrics, they're serious stuff. Yeah, I know. I was know? listening to uh, Extermination okay. all, all to, um, throughout this whole, yeah. I think since I got it. All so. right. Well, good. I'm glad. But, uh, yeah, there's some there's some, uh, there's some heavy stuff lyrically on this, on this well, thing. Well, um, you know, um, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't sing about the devil. We're not... Um, promoting or uh, uh, telling you to commit suicide. You know, we're talking about uh, social injustice, uh, mental disorders, things that we can kind of relate to that the normal Joe Blow can say, oh, wow, yeah I, yeah, I feel that way too. You know, we got a song called Reverse. It's about just turning your life around, going backwards, saying, I'm getting out of here and going that way. And I don't know how Reverse came up, but it's just like, you know, turn about, yourself it's about around. about two minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's about our... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's about the length of our average song. You know, we've played with some bands before who are excellent, excellent players. Uh, but the, after like nine minutes of the same tune, it's like, I'm going to go outside because my ears and I'm going to get a, you know, get things ready. Um, our attention span is real quick and it comes from sort of gimme to that, that punk movement where everything's quick. You know, we have a basic formula and philosophy that we live by. Let's get in, let's get out, intro, outro, segue here and that, uh, repeat that, and let's go. And then after that, it's it's time for the next subject. Let's move on, you know. I'm not going to preach you about anything. We're going to state a couple statements, and, I, and out we go. Um, so where was I? So, okay, so you, you had you had the name, uh -huh. right? You said, and, and Gimme had invited you to go get, grab some beers, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We had already recorded that demo with Mike Dracone and... Uh, the, uh, sorry, the 1987 demo. Not not Swarm Kill, but uh, the demo the, previous to that. Well, that's where this guy comes in. That's that's him on that particular demo. Okay. Yeah. With, uh, uh, just just the, the demo, not the Swarm Kill, right? Correct, right. correct. So if you don't know, there's two demos that came out in 87. Yeah, one of them was the Swarm Kill mm -hmm. with a vocalist on it. And then this one that has this new drummer, and now we're a three-piece, and I'm playing bass and singing. Um, and even some of the songs on there are the same, but we had changed the lyrical content. Okay. We got away from that blood and guts and, you know, typical sort of uh, war theme, and we switched to, you know, uh, instead of the song being called Kill or Be Killed, it is now called Proven Guilty. Same sort of melody line, but the words had changed. And it's about that time him and I saying, well, you know, Remember, we were in that rehearsal hall with Megadeth was there, Dayton, Abattoir, which Juan Garcia went on to Agent Steel. And Body Count. Bo uh, yeah, he's in Body Count now. Uh, I got a story about that little thing real quick. But um, it was we – need, we, we knew that we weren't the best players. We needed to focus on something else. And what we focused on was how tight we could be. Um, our music isn't – really complicated but there are degrees of complexity and we work hard on the pop 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 pop, pop on the breaks the intros and and the way the song can flow where it's comfortable but it's not overbearing mm -hmm. and, and, we're, and we're not playing arpeggios and sweeps and go blah, 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 blah. what i noticed if i can interrupt you real please quick, it was even on the demos like obviously this thing this compilation yes. features Pretty much your whole discography, except yes. like your uh, the two thousand and eight um, the for, four dying world. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, correct, because this is a uh, this, this is, is the a... unreleased. So yeah, that's the unreleased from the nineteen ninety. Correct. With uh, with your demos and but and a couple live tracks and such. Correct. Yeah, because this is this is yes. Marquee Records. Correct. Uh, and so, he and he got it from Blower Records out of Mexico City, who did the first album that we never put out on right. New Renaissance Records. Okay? I'm going to ask you about all this stuff, but my point is, is like even the uh, hey, uh, hey, 
Woo! Many decided to join us. But even with like your demos, they're super tight. Like even even the hits with the bass oh, and the well, drums. You. That was the first thing I noticed. I'm like, wow, this sounds sounds really good. Yeah. Like the, even the the tightness of of uh, of the band. Is just, we work hard on that. You know, if we have to play it. something twelve just times, say you know, thank you, thank you. You know, <laughs> some uh, some people when they rehearse, you know, and the people come in the rehearsals, all of a sudden it's like it's it's show time. It's like no. This is what we're working on. So when we go and do show, people will say, oh, wow, you know? And if someone's sitting there during your rehearsals, like like I said, it becomes a show. It's like, you're not going to be true to your buddy in the band saying, hey, uh, let's do that again because I played it wrong. Or what the hell was that? No one really wants to speak up and be themselves at rehearsal and say, you know, and say, dude, we need to play this again. It's not right. Do it again. Nobody it's not wants right. to be that guy. Well, uh, <laughs> we, we, are that, we are that guy when it's us in that room. Okay. But you, but a band needs to have that guy. That's my point. Yeah. Well, that that guy is Gimme and me. Yeah, some people, some bands don't have you or Gimme. Yeah, they have. Yeah, you need to have a a, a, a hen, you know, for all the roosters, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But um, it, it just worked out good for us being a three piece. I knew I was going to be there. I knew Gimme was going to be there. It's just who's sitting behind us. And about every couple of years, every three four years, I, I look behind and there's someone else sitting there. Uh, the guy that we're playing with right now, on the first trip that he went out with us, I kept calling him Alex, the guy before. And so yeah, it just you know just happened, just happened, you know. But, so so where where were you? Okay, so finished the. Uh, you got a couple beers, and then oh yeah yeah yeah. So uh, he says you want to jam. I'm not, I don't know any songs, and he's always played some insecticide songs. Mm -hmm. So we got together with him. Okay. We already had some material. Kind of reworked it, and like I said, we went from killer be killed to proven guilty. So we wrote some more stuff with him. Uh, did our first gig with him and uh, Bloodlust. Remember Bloodlust from uh, the eighties? Yeah, uh, with Steve Gaines yeah, on, Steve Gaines. Uh, on uh -huh. uh, Guilty as Guilty as Sin. Yeah, yeah, that EP. Our first gig with him was with them, and you know we've been fortunate enough to actually play with a lot of good bands. If you be so kind, spare me just a moment here. Dude, it's your floor, man. Uh, this is a, a list of some bands that I came up with that we have played with okay. last 30 years or so. Uh, some of them you may know, some of them you may not know, but uh, not only are they great bands with great material, uh, they're also our friends. They've been great uh, people to hang out with backstage, and some of these people we still talk with today. And uh, as the list goes, in no particular order, it is um, starting with uh, one of my favorites, one of Gimme's favorites, Dr. No, XL. Vermont, Sick of It All, M.O.D., Guar, Bloodlust, Viking. Remember Viking? Uh, yeah, my uh, dad's neighbor's band. Oh, really? Yeah, they lived right next door to my dad. Oh, which guy? Uh, Matt Jordan used to, uh, drummer. The Matt drummer, Jordan. okay. Uh, I went to school when I was telling you. James? Uh, 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 Brett, remember Brett Erickson? Yeah, he went on to Dark Angel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not his real last name, you know that, right? I know. Okay. Yeah, they had their whole, him and Ron had their whole, their whole... The yeah. thing going, so yeah. Good for him. Yeah, for right? Him. Um, Blood Come. Remember them? It's great. I don't know. It's never happened. All right. Me, so, yeah. yeah, let's hope, let's pray it never does, <laughs> young man. Cover up. There's war out there. Um, <laughs> Evil Dead, Exorder, The Mighty Mighty MX Machine, and uh, yes. my, buddy, my buddy Diego's I'm in that band. Take you in the bird. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, this is the neighbors. I think Diego, I don't know, he... Is he still? He's still with us, right, Diego? Yeah, uh, Danny passed away. Danny, Danny passed away from Abattoir. One of the coolest dudes. He was next door to us in the building in downtown with Megadeth, and I was talking about how uh, how you can emulate yourself and learn something from other people. Right. That is one guy that um, was very something? kind, cordial, and uh, very positive on what you are trying to do, even though if it's not really his thing. Um. I just want to point out to you, my buddy Brendan Stewart, I think who's tuning in, he always tunes in. He, Brendan! Um, he would jam with, with him or something. Like, they were good buddies. Oh, really? Me with about, Danny? Yes, with Danny. Okay. So, um, yeah. yeah. As soon as I showed him my, my MX machine, you uh -huh. know, Manic Panic fucking vinyl. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, you know, he that, was, that kid is like in his 30s now? On, on the, uh, on the album? In his 30s. That album came out like 30-something years ago. Yeah, he was, oh, well, I guess he's older than that. Because <laughs> I did ask Diego that. We went and saw Diego, and I said, hey, how old is that kid now? And, yeah, he was kind of old. With the Batman t-shirt, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh, that's him. But uh, Diego, um, you, you're like Diego. 
Diego's down for the cause and into the scene. Uh, he tried doing a TV show once, and he brought on a Sepultura when they had, uh, what was that guy's name, Darren Green, Derek Green? Derek Green, when they yeah. first joined the uh -huh. band. Yeah. yeah. Um, 90, around 95-ish. Yeah, that's, mid -90s. that's mid yeah, nineties. that sounds about right. But uh, when Diego was doing his show, I think it was towards the end of the nineties, and he was trying to do like some sort of like a uh, uh, what's that show they used to do? Don Kirshner's rock concert, and he did a whole pilot. Wanted to get on Channel Seven. You know, my heart's uh, with Diego because he's into the scene. We went and saw him around Christmas time. He was doing a t uh, uh, Toys for Tots drive. You know, had had uh, some Alice in Chan Chains uh, tribute band play. But if uh, I had unlimited wealth, I would, uh, as you, I would uh, give him money to do what he really wants to do, and you know, for the scene or whatnot. Um, going on from MX Machine, Fear Factory, mm -hmm. Nuclear Crucifixion, who had a guy named Glenn Rambo in the band, who came from Soylent Green. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now Glenn Rambo, he died in Katrina. And he didn't die in Vietnam. No, he did not. No, you would think, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I, that might have been his is that brother. Is a terrible joke? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. I can't be. I, I apologize, ladies wow. and gentlemen. We'll skip off from Glenn Rambo. No, but he, he, was, a good, <laughs> he was a good buddy of ours. And uh, and we miss him. And when I got the phone call that he had passed in. Korea. When was this? I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't mean to uh, to be, uh, what is it? I didn't mean to make jokes. It's no, just we're like, having you know, fun. We're yeah. having, you know what? We're talking <laughs> he about Glenn. He probably Glenn's... would have liked that joke. Yes, he would have. Yes, he would have. <laughs> Um, but, uh, he went on to be in Soil and Green, uh, Gorilla Biscuits. Okay. Uh, now, he went in, one of those guys went like on to do a, uh, uh, it was a Quick, Quick, uh, Quicksilver or Quicksand. Did he go on to do on Quicksand, the guy from Gorilla Biscuits? I think so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we played with those cats. Um, Gamma Side and Dead Horse, both from Texas. Mm -hmm. Both great bands. Great. Gamma Side is awesome. Dude. Yes. Oh, uh, I got something about them later. A band called Hardcore 918V. This was a buddy of ours who actually filled in on drums after we had lost Rich Rowan, who came from Predator. Prophesia. There you go, Angelo. There, there you go, me. Angelo. More. <laughs> More. Uh, do you know what, who the first death metal band is ever to play Cuba is? No, I don't. It's Prophesia. Really? Yeah, Freddie's band, so... I'm just throwing a plug like, out there to Freddie. They're like a local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Freddie, I ran. We ran into Freddie. Uh, we went to go see some bands out in LA, and Freddie. They're was there. great dudes too, man. They are. They are. That's why I'm mentioning these guys because I got to give them a plug because believe it or not, a lot of these guys are still doing it. Some of them aren't. I mean, you take someone like e Juan from Evil Dead. You know, I'm happy he, he's in body count. I'm, I'm glad he's he's he gets to chase his dream and 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 play guitar for a living. I walked into a bar one night. And I looked at the TV and body body count was on. It was on a late night or whatever. And I see some guy, and I'm all, damn, that looks like one. I go, no, it can't be. And then uh, he had a beanie on, and then they, they pulled back, and I saw his BC Rich. I picked up my phone. I called Juan. I said, hey, Juan. I go, it's probably kind of late, but I'm watching TV out here, and I think I see you on the late show. He called me back the next day. Yeah, that was me, man. We were in New York. And I'm all, dude. I go, I, you know. So anyways, that's how I got the news. He was in body count. LSN, of course, is on this list. The Mentors. Yes. We played with the mentors. I got to, you know, you got to get El Duce, story dude. Them. Well, oh, here's man. the thing. We played with them after El Duce. Let me just pop in the story real quick. Sure. A few years back, we went up to, uh, we went up towards Modesto and Fresno, and we played uh, Thrashopolis, Thrash Ocalypse. And the mentors was on the bill. When Gimme said, hey, the mentors are going to be on the bill, I said, dude, how can it be the mentors, dude? Imp impossible. Dude, you'd be surprised. When I saw them, I was like, wow, this sounds exactly like the mentor. Even like even the new singer that they yeah. got, the new singer drummer uh -huh. with all the fucking naked ladies uh -huh. on the drum set. It's really weird. I don't know why. Like, No, I hear you. I hear you. Is that El Duce's kit that he just like <laughs> decided to use with all the naked ladies and uh, all the fat chicks on the... Uh... It, it could have been one that they had in storage. <laughs> but when Gimme said we were playing with a mentor, it was like, no way, no way. And uh, okay, I... I ran my mouth a little bit about how can it be the mentor. So we're up there playing Thrash Oculus, and this guy comes up front, right in front, and he just starts headbanging and getting down, and, and we get done. He's all, dude, I'm so bummed I missed your saves. I've been waiting to see you guys, man. And he's all, I'm playing too. And I said, oh, cool. I, I go, who are you playing with? And he's all, the mentors. And I was all, the mentors? And he's all, yeah, I'm the drummer. Uh, and I said, dude, That guy's really good. He is. Like he's, he I is. just wanted to interrupt. No, 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 he's no, really no. Good. He is great. He sounds just like him, and he's a down to earth cat. And I, I told him, I said, I said, dude, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I go, I've been saying stuff about this, you know, without El Duce. He's all, he's all, I get it. It's okay. Saw the set. Oh, pal. Oh, I, dude. I, I will never do that again. I wish they would record something though, dude. It pisses me off when like they, they have these old bands have these like new guys and they uh -huh. don't record anything for fucking 
15 years. Yeah. Well, you also get those bands that come back around and there's only like one guy in there who's really original or something like that, you know. Yeah, but record some new stuff. Yeah, like, you why should. live off the legacy of you guys are like that too. Yeah. Though. And no offense, dude. I just gotta, I gotta be honest. Yeah. And say I, you know, I wish you had fucking more records and. No, I hear. No, I hear you. I hear. Pretty uh, much the one. For the Dying World album album never really took off, and uh, I was gonna bring that. I have one copy, and it's still wrapped in um in uh, the the Saran wrap. But uh, after uh, the Mentors, Brujeria, Strike Master, Heretic, Silent Scream, Hellion, Fueled by Fire, Marky, Ramon, and the Queers. And last, and surely not the least, Madras. Those are the, all Thank the hot you. bands and great that. bands, uh, great friends, great times. You know, and I figure if we have this op- if I have this opportunity, I, I want to put a shout out to them, cats. And, then, and if anyone's watching and they want to tune in and check out one of those bands, please do because they're all great bands. Absolutely. And all and there's the, uh, man. There's a, I was going to mention another band, um, Lechuma Senses. I thought was is really cool that. Uh, They've been around doing it forever that nobody knows who they are. I don't know who they are. Lechima Sensei? No. They're like uh, Los Angeles, like, they're from a, they're a death metal band from Los Angeles and have been doing it for fucking ever. Oh, really? No, I do not yeah. know that band. So make sure you go check them out too. All right. Are they playing anywhere soon? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think they play as often as you think. Right. <laughs> but um, they're another one of those bands that they haven't really done like a lot, but they've been around uh-huh. forever. So it's just a matter of like, well, that's that. Uh, that's it's a matter a of putting out new records, isn't that the whole point of yeah, being a musician yeah, yeah. and not, you know, doing the same thing for thirty yeah. years? It's also hard sometimes for bands to get together and actually find the time to write material. So yeah, you know, uh, I'll, I'll make a point of that in my mental notes up here to go see them. And I'm not throwing you under the bus. No, just, no, 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 you, no. This is what <laughs> we need. I'm trying I'm to fucking light the fire no. under your ass so you can she, fucking record more stuff, yeah, and no, so I, I can be happy as a that. listener, dude. She hears me play my wrist in the living room. She's like, why hasn't this been recorded in 20 years? It's like, oh, I, good I don't question. Know. I don't know. Gimme, you listening? Call up. Say something. New record, dude. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, actually, if you need help that. recording it, dude, I'll fucking. <laughs> I know, I know people, dude. Funny you should mention that. Uh, he, we got a call uh, a few weeks ago from our buddies in uh, Houston from the band called HRA, Heavy Roach Activity, mm-hmm. and they want to do a uh, split seven inch. So we said we do you should all do our that. new stuff on that, but you know, it's, now it comes down to logistics. Got to rehearse. Got to get the songs tight. Got to make sure we know what we're doing. Get it recorded and then ship it off to get manufactured. You got to do A, B, and C before you do E, F, G. I know, but you got to like actually do A, B, and C. Yeah, I to get to yes. D, e, you're, F, you're and... preaching to the choir. <laughs> Hopefully, that can be no. like the A that lights the fire under you guys' asses and fucking well, does something because it, you you're should. you're a great band. Like well, I'm not trying to kiss ass. No, I'm just no, saying no, no, this no. is. Awesome that uh-huh. I wish you had more material than just No, that. I hear you. No, I hear you. So let's back up real quick. Okay. Got off on a little bit of a tangent. Nineteen ninety rolls around. Well let's uh let's so go after back you, and hear, after, hear more. Okay, so after you so we'll do the demos then. Yes. So what came of it? What was the what was the reaction in nineteen eighty seven when these demos first came out or was there anything? Did what did you guys do with it? We would buy boxes of cassettes. Hundreds at a time, and you could get them for like twenty-five cents per cassette. You still can, by the way. Oh, <laughs> I haven't even looked into that. <laughs> but uh, at one point, we had uh, fifteen hundred cassette demos out, and then you know, tape trading was big back then, and you would split a, a cassette with somebody, and uh, a band like Schizo would be on one side, and we'd be on the other side. But uh, we had lost Sean. And in our building, remember I told you, telling you about this building? It all one giant circle. Uh, Predator was in an adjacent building, mm-hmm. and I had known the guitar player. Because remember that guy I told you that came into the uh, the record store from England? He was dating uh, that guitar player's sister. So that's how I kind of met Jeff, because when he came to Los Angeles, mm-hmm. he's from Hawaii. They were called um, uh, Deceiver. Okay. And then he started doing the Predator band. And they found this cat named Rich Rowan. And then uh, Rich Rowan uh, didn't stay with Predator. And then he went to LSN, and they started butting heads. And since we were kind of buddies with Rich, we said, hey, we're looking for a drummer. Rich Rowan got into our band, and probably within three months, we were hitting the United States on this demo. And uh, the buddy I was telling you about from Albuquerque, he told me he was talking to Gene Hoagland one day, and the name insecticide, me and Gimme came up, and Gene Hoagland told him, which my buddy told me, he says, he said that insecticide is the only band that he knows of 
that toured the United States on a demo cassette. When we got back from that tour in 1988, we got a phone call from New Renaissance Records. And they offered us to be on this. Oh, man. What is... Yes. Dude, I've, I've seen this. We asked to be the first song on side one or the last song on side two. Oh and God, as you can dude. see by where it's at, we got neither. No, but they got the first song yes. on side B. Yeah, there you go. There you go. You know where I got that record from? We went in to go do a show up in Bakersfield, and the promoter had found that in a pawn shop, in a, in a thrift store, and had given it oh. to us. Because I, I never got one. I had one, I probably gave it away. And he had given me his copy that he got in a thrift store. You know, you need to keep this, dude. Like, there's no way, like... I always say you need to keep everything that you've ever done. Yeah, yeah, like, no, I agree. Just, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm you gonna, move and things this. go into a box and... I'm going to do this right in front of you. I just yeah, have to do it, do it, do it. And it's thin, but it works. It's a little, well... Yeah. There's a little bit of a uh, uh, warp to but it, yeah. you know what? It's a record, dude. Yeah, no doubt. I gotta send you one of ours that we made it on oh, a compilation. Please. I'll, oh, I'll send it to you. Who else is on it? Uh, the No Legacy compilation. It's it's been making the rounds, which is amazing. But um, you gonna do a Legacy number two, no legacy, number two? The, yeah, my buddy Eric's the guy that that is responsible for that. Okay. He's gonna do one. He asked us to be a part of it. All right. So I was like, you know what? I'm only gonna do it if it's like if I'm only on two of them because I'm not gonna be on every single No Legacy comp. Okay. I'm only gonna be on. I was on the first one. We'll do no, we'll do one more. Okay. You know what I mean? Make it fair for the. Rest of the bands, sure, I sure, want to sure. be on it, right? Sure. Wow, that's cool. I want, I want to. Well, actually, we can, we can fucking play that right now, dude. Crazy. We should um, just play it right now. If you could hook that up, you could I could. I could probably hook up that record player right underneath you. Do it. Crank it up. Yeah. Put it on eleven. I might have to, right. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, we were going to be moving around a lot. Yeah, I know, and we have a pop. We're no, doing like we... a live show right now. No, so. it's long. We were in San Antonio, Texas, and we did a show with Gamicide and a band from Pleasanton Valley. They were called Tyrannicide. We labeled that show Sideshow, like the Hellstar song. That Hellstar is another band that nobody oh, yeah, knows yeah. that I wish more people did too. Oh, another funny. Texas band that's I absolutely fucking love. Funny you mention that. Out. Remember, I was telling you earlier about Sherman's Tank. Uh, my buddy is friends with uh, James Rivera. Dude, one of the mo like one of the most humble guys mm -hmm. I think I've ever met. Very, very. Uh, he said he'd sing on one of the Sherman Tank songs because Sherman Tank is going to be a bunch of different people playing. That's because awesome. I, I don't I don't have a band and then, and like you said you got to put the stuff out right so it'd just be easier for me to just get a bunch of guys to come in and say. So this is like your pro song. bot. Excuse me. This is like your pro bot. Yeah, you could say that. You're just gonna get a bunch of singers that you like and put it on on the same record and guitar players. You there know, you go. I might play guitar on, on a song or two and just get a bass. I get Angela to play bass. You know, this, my stuff is simple. Like I said earlier, it's just I would love to. I would love to play it on the same track as Angela. Oh well, well then you two do that and I'll sing. Cool. All right. Or you two do that and I'll sing, dude. Right. I don't care either way, <laughs> dude. We'll figure it out. I yeah. like that. Re remind me. I I I'd be honored and down, dude. All right. All right. Um, but um. So let's let's back up real quick. Okay. So you turned on the demo. Yes. What came of it? Uh, a call like that from New Renaissance Records. A lot of connections. A lot of friends, and and, when, and able to go back out again. Okay. So then you. So then after the tour, mm -hmm. you had two demos out by that. It's been ten years. We're deciding what we want to do, and we're sitting in the bar one night, and we come up with. Actually, Jimmy did. He came up with eyeball. It's like, hey, you know what? That might be good because in sex side, it just sounds kind of metal. It's not going. Eyeball kind of opens up the the vast horizons for us. Like, oh, what is an eyeball? So what we did was we continued playing insecticide songs, but we wrote new songs under eyeball, such as Reverse and Vortex. Okay. Now, remember I told you the drummer was kind of slow and he just liked stoner rock? It just wasn't working. And around this time, I decided that I needed to clean up my act. I was doing a lot of partying. And uh, what I figured out was one or two things was going to happen. Uh, I was going to hurt somebody in my car, driving intoxicated, mm -hmm. or I was going to uh, pull the Bon Scott and do so or something. I I'd get in my own accident. Right. So I decided to uh, just chill out for a while. And I chilled out for about a year. And what in retrospect, what I should have did was I should have told Gimme, dude, I need some time off and let's just go our separate ways for a while and we'll get back together. But I didn't. 
and uh, it was about a year, and Gimme and I went to a bar, and he's all, I'm leaving Eyeball, and it's like, okay, and he's all, you can keep Lewis, and I'll just go do my own thing, and I said, well, why why do I want to stay with Lewis, because he's not really, I, I had a double bass pedal on my drum set, and I gave it to him that he never used, and uh, is Reverse on this one? Um... No, we got a song uh, that we do. It's called Reverse. Uh huh. And I wrote that in spite of Lewis playing slow. Because Gimme started writing some really, really slow riffs. And we came up with riffs like Media Man, which we play as Insecticide, but it was kind of written under eyeball. Mm -hmm. And it was just slow. We got another song called, uh, well, actually, the name changed to Omega Dawn. And it's just slow. You know? Sounds I, like a doom metal band name. Yeah. Yeah. So I just. It's like, no, I'm going to go do my own thing. And Gimme went and did his own thing. And Gimme got into Beowulf. Remember Beowulf? Yes. It's one big circle. And our buddy Deanish, who helped us out, was in Beowulf. It's all right there. It kind of reminds me of like Black Sabbath, Rainbow, and Deep Purple. The way they just all switch people around. But it's you know, it's kind of like LSN and Angel Angelos in every band, you know? But uh, um, I found a drummer. And he was kind of out of practice, so I spent about a year, a year with him while he got up his chops, and I found a guitar player. And probably within three months of getting the guitar player and spending a year with my drummer, I did a different approach this time. Instead of having a drummer and he's learning all our songs and we go out and play, it's like, I'm going to sit with this guy and we're going to just, you know... Hash it out. Hash it out. Have a have a beverage or something and uh -huh. be friends. And mm -hmm. so then it's easier for us to jam together. Kind of exactly. Kind of that was an approach I had never done. It was always all get in the band, we're going, we're going to Portland, we've got to be there in a month. You know, you gotta <laughs> learn the song. You know, you don't have time, you don't have time to breathe. You don't have time to really grow because it's like, this is what we're doing, and you're gonna go it this way. You know? So, anyways, the, the drummer improved, he got better, and uh what was what I liked about both these cats and eyeball was they were very moldable. And they followed my lead. But what I also noticed was, you know, for 10 years prior, I was, I'd always look to my left. And uh, Gimme was always there. And now I was looking to my left, and he wasn't there anymore. You know? And I remember once um, something happened, and I told the guys, I, it, and we're still in that rehearsal hall in downtown. I had gone back there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember one night, I told the guys, I can't make it tonight. You guys go down there and work on some stuff. This is what I want you to do. And then when I came back for the next rehearsal, and uh, my drummer told me, he's all, uh, we were talking why uh, you weren't there, and we decided that, you know, this is your band and project, and we're going to, you what you want us to do, you let us know. And it's like, wow, okay, all that weight goes back on my shoulder again. I, and I thought I was distributing it a little bit. It's you know? so hard, dude. It's, it's, I'm in like this. I've been in the same boat for like years until this particular lineup. So I know exactly how you feel. Where it's like you want the other guys to contribute, and they're not because it's it's your band. It's like well, a band is own is is a band. It's yeah. not like it's it's not it's, just you. Yeah, no, it's not the Sherman Jones uh, group project. No. It's, it's it's eyeball and it's us. But uh, after about getting three months in, the, in that drummer, we got a gig to go open for Saxon, and. Uh, it and was, this was what year? Uh, this was uh, 1998, uh, thereabouts, okay. thereabouts. And it was bittersweet because I had branched out on my own. I had two new buddies. Uh, things were looking good. We were doing a lot of gigs. You know, I, I was using my connections from Insecticide, and I was going to Albuquerque and Phoenix and taking these guys with me. Uh, quick story I want to tell you about those guys. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> the bittersweet part was uh, Gimme came to the gig, and... Gimme should have been there, right? And it, and he wasn't. I got I just got emotional. But uh, um, getting back to to the in, insecticide thing, I remember uh, uh, the the day I heard that the, my drummer had passed, and uh, Gimme had called me. And yes, if I was all right, I said yeah. So. Um. <clears throat> We got a gig, Eyeball, mm -hmm. in uh, New Mexico from my buddy that we met back in, like, 1986. Okay. And he was just a kid that did a magazine, stapled together, and he went to every gig. And he, and he, That's still uh, in one of the 
how should I put this? Most important people of any metal community is mm. somebody that does the physical thing, and it's it's like you need to have those people. Mm. You need to have mm. promotion and marketing, and having those guys that can do magazines, like not necessarily can play in bands, but mm. can you know help promote the bands that he or she loves. Absolutely, you need to have that. That's absolutely. what Brian Slagle is. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Brian Slagle was on. Remember Candy C. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were doing some show one night, and I actually called up uh, to talk to Brian Slagle. Mm-hmm. And what I said, the first thing I said to him was, "There's a there's a, a law that I, I live by," and I said, um, "Denim and leather brought us all together, but it was Brian Slagle who set the spirit free." And when I said that, I I hear them laughing. They're all, all right, cool. So I asked a couple questions, and I got off, and I ran back to the radio to listen to it. And they're all, oh, wow, yeah, that guy, oh, what was his name? They couldn't remember my name. I was like, ah, shucks. But anyways, um, um, remember when Iron Maiden came back and they did that uh, tour again of Somewhere in Time or whatever? Right, the, the, the either late 2000s or the early 10s. Now I have to say 10s and 2000s. Um, it, it, well, let's see, my kid's 19. Uh, yeah, that was about, that's about right because uh, my son started living with me about that time Fuck. and I think it was, was 2010 or 2011, I want to say. E- either or, but that's about the time. Um, I took my son to that concert. Okay. Now, we didn't get in. They were playing at the Forum, a couple, house, a couple miles away yeah, from my house. I, I remember when that happened, too. I didn't get tickets. I was bummed as hell. I was waiting in line, waiting for someone to open up. Now, I found some tickets there, but they weren't together. And it's not, it's not like my son's 19 where I say, I'll meet you at the car. He's 10. I got to be with him. Something to happen. I never hear the end of it from his mom. So we wait in line, and then as we're waiting in line, I saw Brian Slagle walk up, got his ticket, and walked back. And as Brian Slagle passed me, I went, excuse me, Mr. Slagle. And he turned to me, and I didn't say anything about Oz Records or nothing. And I just said, congratulations on, on your 25th. That was about the 25th year event mm-hmm. for... for um, no Blade. Yeah. yeah. And I, I said, congratulations. I, I go, this is my son. We're trying to get into the Iron Maiden for, for his first time. He's all right, cool. And I go, you have a good night. And that was it. I, you know... I'm not going to stop me. Hey, dude, I used to go to your shop when I, when I was his age. and you know. But no, it's like, it wasn't about that at that moment. It was just like, I wanted to say thank you and congratulations for what you've done. At that specific moment, it was about Ryan Slate. Right. You know. And we never got an Iron Maiden. And, and off we go on to another story. So where'd we leave off at? Remember, you got to reel me in. Yeah, that's right. That's what my job is. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about um, unfor- an unfortunate passing of... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, of Sean, I believe what it's. Well, his Sean name. Dra- died, the drummer from uh, Insecticide, mm-hmm. and then this guy Kip, who it became the drummer of Man. Eyeball after Lewis the the the, the Stone. You guy. have like spinal tap syndrome. Yeah, right? I do. I do. Um, so we got this gig in Albuquerque. Okay. And year? What year? Uh, it was two thousand and one. Okay. And it was uh the be- it was uh. The beginning of September. Oh no! And uh, this is where it kind of gets confusing. I, I need to look at my charts. So if I remember correctly, um, we had gotten this gig, okay, with Eyeball, with my two new guys, with my buddy Mike Trujillo that we've known for a long time. Started with the Staple magazines, and he's our friend to this day. And when we play Media Man, we dedicate it to him. And the next time we play Media Man, I dedicate it to you. No matter where we are, I dedicate it. I appreciate that. So we are in Albuquerque, and what happened was I had had to get rid of Kip, the drummer, mm-hmm. and I called Deanish from 918V. Remember, it's revolving door. I go, dude, I, I, I need a drummer. Do me a favor, man. We got a real short said, you know, you kind of know the songs. It's real simple, all this stuff. And he said, I'll do it. So I'm talking to Mike. I said, okay, I'm coming out with Deanish. I'm coming out with, with, uh, with uh, Derek. And then it's just like, is Gimme coming for the, just to hang out? And I said, I don't know. So I called Gimme and I was all, hey, going to Albuquerque, playing one of Mike's rock and roll shows. Travagantas. Yeah. And uh, so Gimme came with us, brought his guitar, and during that set, he joined us and we played Media Man. It's the only time Insecticide or Eyeball had had another guitar player on stage. Wow. It's, it's always been us three. 
And yeah, it's always been a three piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I bought one of the three piece. Gimme was there, Ex- and we, we except were so- from the first demo that you said that somebody sang on, right? Cor- so correct, like correct, a- correct. Yeah, some of those things. Is like, I, There's I, some gray area here. Yeah. But, you know. Well, you want to see some gray area? It's up here, buddy. Right oh there. no! Don't yeah. even get me started uh, on on. Yeah, that's why I wear a hat all the uh, time. <laughs> I like your hat now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But uh, uh, we were supposed to play "Proven Guilty" too. Okay. But when we were doing "Media Man," it, it, it's kind of long and drawn out. Those two guitar players started switching off leads and that wasn't rehearsed and i remember looking over and saying, just, go, right, just go with the flow i'm dude. going with the just flow go with it dude but you know what i also remember i also remember and there's a packed house i remember looking over and saying he's there he's to my left how sweet is this this is what insecticide has become i got my best you know, my guitar player now is my best friend. I got, I got my best friends right here. We're in another state, and we're playing. People are getting into it, and life is good. Let me backtrack real quick. The first time Insecticide went out, mm-hmm. we got two gigs in Albuquerque with from this guy, Mike. Do you remember the year? It was 1988. So uh, early in was, your career. Okay. Yeah, it was 1988. We had followed wherever we went. White Zombie was coming or just left. We had we always crossed paths, but we never got on the same bill. And I'm sure if we would have got on the same bill, we would have talked to Rob, right? We would have right. he would be on this list, and we would be calling him friends and have information and their phone numbers and go to their gigs and talking and whatnot. Absolutely, it, it just never crossed. But anyway, you know, and I, I like horror films too, so we probably would have hit it off. But. Um, so we're going in out to Albuquerque, and the first gig we do in another state, there is a band opening for us. Come on, I need you to think now. What do you think that? What do you think the name of that band was? What, what's the name of the state? Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we're playing. Um, we're playing Joe's Garage. Okay. No, no. I'm. I, I, excuse me. Uh, we are. We are. We're, yeah, we're playing Joe's Garage. It's not. Not Hellstar or Gamma. Side. No, 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 no. This is not Texas. No. New Mexico. You'll, you'll I, never guess it. It's I, in the, I don't, it's I don't in the even, story I was telling you. I don't even know any a lot of bands from yeah. New Mexico. They were nobody. Here, here's the gag. That band was called Enforcer. Remember, I was looking right. at it. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. On the paint. The yeah. paint. Yeah, on the, on the, and this sex- isn't the Swedish um, Enforcer. Obviously, that made this made a huge impact in today's. Metal yeah, scene. no, it is not. Them. This no. is another one yeah. from. Yeah, the guy wore like a, a leopard skin trench coat or whatnot. But it's just funny that here I am. I find the name on the back of a bottle of of, of enforcer. You should have brought the paint can for yeah. the sign. Yeah, no, we are now called titanium dioxide. That that would have been the band in between you guys. Yeah, no doubt, huh? Yeah, <laughs> keeps everything together. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Right about then, nine uh, eleven happens, and uh, a lot of things changed. Yes. You know, uh, in our arguably one of the two major events in our history that have changed the world. Oh, yeah, in, in a single moment. I agree. Uh, the other one being JFK. I agree. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but getting back to that gig, I had a bunch of gigs lined up, and then the dime bag thing. So oh yeah, three. So yeah, that, like yeah, that, that changed. That's a that changed. Every, yeah, it's a terrible tragedy. Um, quick side note on that. Oh, we good on time, right? Yeah, driving? dude, dude, I got. We we got like another hour. Dude. Oh, okay. Don't All even, right. This is your show. Okay. I'm just the host. Thank you, man. Thank you. Keep going, dude. Um, we used to play this place in Dallas. Okay. Fort Worth. It was called. Uh, you know what? That was Joe Joe's Garage, uh, Albuquerque. Uh, I I have to get back on what the name of that. That was uh, Club Rec. Excuse me. It was in an automotive parking structure. Super badass, dude. Yeah. Those are the gigs. Those are the gigs that like wow mean the most sometimes. You know, I was like, look what they're doing. Just to have have us here. And, you know, and, and how, how people come to this place to... We've played some places I was like, wow, like this is the atmosphere is just way too cool. Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, you're playing Las Cruces. Yes, I believe so. I believe the show might be still up in the air. It's either Las Cruces or El Paso. It's literally like right there. Okay. Um, if it's uh, Las Cruces, is it uh, John from the Batcave? Because he's a buddy of mine. I think it's, it's Bong Man. Bong Man is, is helping us out with... Uh, What's his real name? That is a good question. Okay, if it's John, you tell him Sherman says hi. Uh, he did the Raven show, and Raven loved his place. Oh yeah, that was that's him. Oh okay, that's him. You yeah, him, he's been in my house. His band's been out here, and you know I, I try. He's a great dude. He took he, he took care of us, and and uh, yeah, huge shout out to Bong Man. Bong Man, does he know about your show? 
He's the, the guy. He's the promoter, I think, of uh, of it. He booked us last no, time. No, does he know about this show? This oh, the, I don't the podcast. Even, I don't even know. I should. I should invite him. Yeah, I, I have him on Facebook. Right. So will you tell him I said hey? I will. I will right. absolutely. Great guys. He's See, all, one we, of the best, we, dude. We meet. We have met all these people over the years, you know, and it just, it just branches well, out. So it's, our community is so small. It is. It, we but can't, it's huge. We can't. Well, but yeah, but we can't afford to have like any like any misstep in our careers mm-hmm. is is a huge like detriment for us. Like you can't have like a be in a band where like you've you know fucked some other chick yeah, dude's yeah. chick or something yeah. in another band. It just it, it does it's not gonna work. Like, no, I hear you. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's, and I've it's an stories. integrity thing for me. No, 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 no. You, uh, regardless if it's the metal community or not, you should have integrity for yourself. Well, yes, but I'm saying like a, a comedian mm-hmm. like. There's there's no room for error, if you can help it in the, in our community because it's how small it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, word will get around. Right. Um, funny you should mention that because uh, I've heard stories about other bands and what they've done. It's like, oh, that's screwed. I'd never do that. The it's first, only until you meet them, though. Remember that. Yeah, yeah. We were in Houston, and we ended up playing this place. Okay. Uh, it was called the Axiom. The guy's name was Jr. Uh, I don't know if you know, but I, I do shows and I do under the name Nationwide Attractions. When Insecticide went out for the first time, and, and even even when we were doing shows, I always said I was Sherman from Nationwide Attractions for that perception of, oh, wow, these guys are got a management company. No, it was just me at the house calling them on well, my phone. Sometimes that's that's what it, that's seriously what it takes. It's, yeah. all about, it's all about how you market yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I came across this place from someone that wrote me a letter. that you should come here to Houston and play the accent. Well, I had gotten the number and I had called the guy. And he, I was telling her this story the other night. Uh, he was the first guy to call me out. Uh, I went there. We went there, introduced ourselves. Uh, he had it upstairs with the shower, and he did his graphics up there and stuff. And then after the show, he came up and he's all, you're also in the band. And I'm all, yeah, I yeah. am. Well, anyways, he's still a friend of ours to this day. But we went to the East Coast and came back. And on the way back, we stopped off at, uh, we did another show at the Axiom. We had a day off, and we were actually living at this place, sleeping on the pool tables. The guy had TV there. One night we had free beer. He had a barbecue there and stuff. He had, he had to go out, and he said, "Hey, man, my beer guy's coming. Uh, here's the money. Pay him when I when, pay him when he gets here, and uh, bring the beer in." And we're all, "All right, all right." Well, when the beer guy came, we paid. We got the receipt. And we unloaded the beer, and we brought it in the place for him. There would have been bands that would have took the money and run. the beer and split. We did. He's our buddy. Why do you want to do that to the guy who's who every band? You ever see that one video of a uh, testament? There's like an old house next to the club. I don't remember what song it is, but anyways, that's right next to the axiom because that's where they filmed it. Um, everyone played this place. It, 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 it was it's the equivalent of the whiskey in Hollywood. Everyone everyone goes to the axiom. So it's like, why do you want to do that to this guy? But there would have been people that it's like doing to Jason Tyler. Just there's no point. Yeah, like no. he's like the one guy you don't, you know, you actually want to work with. That's probably going to take care of you in like the long run. You yeah. know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Is it worth your what thirty bucks for beer? Uh, it was it was hundreds of dollars in okay, the beer. Well, is it worth? No, it is no. not. It is not. And I don't know how we got on that, but no. Um, bring me up to pace. Where are we at? Uh, 2001 are, came up? Oh, I yes, wonder, real, yes. Real quick nine, side nine, note. 9-11 happened. 9-11 happened. Real quick side note, because I brought up, uh, there was a place in Dallas. It was called Joe's Garage. And Joe's Garage was like the whiskey of Dallas. And uh, <clears throat> I was talking earlier about how people can be approachable and people are kind and they, they you know, you could talk to them and then you got the other people that are standoffish. Um, I was down at Cox Arena with some buddies and uh, they were friends with... Um, uh, Phil and Samo, and that's when it was um, um, the Slayer tour, and I forget the band that opened up uh, in front of Slayer. But anyways, we were all backstage. And you don't want to open up for you don't want to open up for Slayer. Well, they did. Pantera? No, no, no. It, w- it was an opener, Slayer, and then Pantera. Remember okay. that gig? They, they did that tour. I don't. I, okay. I wasn't obviously around back okay. back in those the early days. All right, but um, I didn't get into metal. I think until. 2003? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Right around when Pantera, uh, you know, or Dime had his... The accident. Yeah. Okay. Well, they were on tour. Slayer opened up for Pantera. It's down at Cox Arena. I'm down there. And uh, I saw Kerry King, and we just started talking, and, you know, we, we talked a little bit about L.A. and whatnot. I, I got a picture of him and I, and then um, I saw Rex, 
and I went up to Rex, and I just, I just said, I just out of a friendly conversation to, you know, see what he says or to start the conversation. Which, if someone would have said what I said to him, I would probably say, "Oh wow!" I just said, "Hey, uh, this is a Far Cry. You wear Cox Arena, dude." And I just said, "Far Cry from Joe's Garage," and he like looked at me like, "How do you know Joe's Garage?" Like, and he's all, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," and went on his way. It's fine. Now, if I would have been in that predicament and someone said to me, hey, dude, uh, I saw you at the anti clubs, like, no way! You know, th that's me. So, that, that's the little side note on Pantera. So, um, I had set up, some, going back to Eyeball, I had set up some gigs. I mm -hmm. lost a drummer. I got Gimme, I got this drummer, and I canceled all the other dates except the one in Albuquerque because he's our buddy, right? And I remember sitting in the classroom. It was Monday. Oh, dude, okay. that, that was one of those weekend trips. It was like we left on a Friday evening. We pulled in on a Saturday. We did the gig. We stayed up till 2, 3, 4 in the morning, got back in the car 7 in the morning, and, and drove home. Actually, I think we left around noon because wow. you, you gained that hour. And I was, the, I was the guy driving home at 3 o'clock in the morning, dropping everyone off. And I'm going to work the next day. Remember, I work in a classroom. Oh God! So you got to be at you got to be at work at seven o'clock in the morning. I eight. I need to be in class for a day. Oh man, you know, it's two three That's in the morning. Brutal. I'm I'm driving down through uh, the Cajon Pass. That's brutal, dude. You're still not home yet. You got to drop everybody off. So it's, you're not going to get home till four in the yeah, morning or something. It's the lifestyle, and I love it. And if I didn't care for it, like you were talking about a career, you know, I don't look at it as work. It's like this is what we got to do. But it's Monday, and I'm sitting in the classroom, and I remember just looking down, and I'm thinking to myself. What am I doing here? I don't want to be in this classroom, you know? I'm supposed to be around this time right now. I should be in El Paso, Las Cruces, because we just did Albuquerque on Saturday. I should be on my way to San Antonio. That, that was a little tour I had set up, but I had lost the drummer. And it, there's no way Deanish could have done the tour with it. So let's just go do Mike's. It's a weekend trip. He's our bro. You know, let's do it. We're committed. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And just thinking, what am I doing here? I, I don't want to be here. And the next day was 9-11. It's like, oh, wow, good thing I didn't go out because, you know, everything was kind of stopped off anyway. probably appreciate your job a little bit more after <laughs> after that too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a month later, I told you I, I do gigs under Nationwide mm -hmm. Attractions. About a month later, I was doing my own gig. And I remember, I, I, I don't really look at them as gigs. I look at them as events. And okay. giving always kind of gives me some crap. Oh, dude, you want to bring out the dudes and the cannons and the, and the clowns and stuff like that? It's like, no, I just, I just want an event. I had this one show where a girl came down and, she was twirling fire and lit her nipples on fire. You know, that's part of the show. Sounds hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, at this particular show, I had a comedian, you know. it's And I just don't want to play music loud in between the bands. Let's do something. I have a trivia contest. I do all sorts of weird things when I can because I want it to be an event. So okay, about a month so after 9-11, I had this show going on. I actually brought some uh, flyers. You want to get those out for me, sweetie? Yeah, you brought a bunch of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I brought a bunch like, of stuff. We I think we're supposed to like show a case yeah. it, like in between all this, the, the yeah. history of you. So let's let's do that, right? Okay. Let's do some of that right now. So uh, I remember the comedian calling me and saying, dude, is, and uh, one of the bands I had was from up north. He's an old buddy of ours. He's all, dude, is the show still happening? I said, dude, the show's got to go on. It happened about wow, a month Look at all this stuff. This is just some, this is just the, the big stuff. Like, here, here's a couple shows that I did. Yeah, I know. See, I go underneath Nationwide Attractions. That one's called the Psycho Sermon. Those are all the different people on the bill. You can see it right there. Mm -hmm. Here's another gig I did. I called it the War Zone, and this is Crisis from New York. They're on the bill. Okay. You know, a nice flyer right there. Thank you, thank you. Here is it show about a month after 9-11. So this, this is 2003, it says on here. Oh, 2003. Actually, I think that it was uh, uh, two, two, uh, it was a couple days after 9-11. That's what it was, and that's what and he he was saying, dude. Oh, is it still going on? It's like yes, it's got to go on. Wow. You know, these guys are coming down from San Francisco. The show's got to go on. I don't even. What, I mean, what was the what was the the vibe like here? At you know, well, it was. Uh, sometimes you have to put things away and uh, let's have some fun. And I yeah, I know the country's grieving, but you know, um, you know, people are coming down to play. I've been advertising it, you know. Uh, let's try and get our mind off of this. I love it. There's a there's a place called the Thirst. Oh, yeah. Let's go to the Thirst. Like it. And then here's a, another gig. You know. Now I was telling Gina the story about this one. You know, I just don't do the gigs. I try and do events, and mm -hmm. I try and 
make the bands feel like they're important because I've been in that position. Oh, so where, you don't play every single no, one No, no, I put it on. You put it on. Yeah. Like I'm asking if you want to do the, 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 the Hemlock gig if they come and play at my place. I want to make the bands, you know, I've been in that predicament where I'm in the middle of nowhere and, they, and they, someone comes up to you and say, hey, we got you the beers. Hey, uh, there's a sandwich shop down the street. Well, we're going to get you your food now. You know, I want that, you know. The hospitality my job, is amazing, dude. Yeah, my job as a promoter is to make you f have to make you feel comfortable and have a good show, you know. And this particular show right here, I remember telling my headliner Willow's Wisp, mm -hmm. I said, "Hey man, we're gonna have a, a six foot sandwich. And try and get there because it's probably gonna be gone by nine. And the guy showed up at ten o'clock, and I was all, "Dude, all the food's gone." And he's all, "Oh." And I said, "There was a Jack in the Box down the street." And I said. Find out what everybody in your band wants, and I'll be back in a couple minutes. Came back, they wanted Jumbo Jacks, fries, scope, and I went and got it. Here you go. It's wow. not the sandwich we had, but I told you there'd be food. Uh, and you were also supposed to be here before nine. But anyways, you know, I want you to, to feel important. Uh, here's another show. This was a, a band from World War III Records. Uh, Juan Garcia from Agent Steel started working for World War III Records. Okay. Uh, I ran into Juan. Uh, so it's a band called Hate Theory. Yeah, they were from Ohio. That. Yes. So they were from Ohio. I was at the California Metal Fest when Venom was supposed to play out in San Bernardino. Were you at that one? That was, ooh. Yeah, it might have been before 2003. Yeah. Right around then. Venom was supposed to play, but they didn't. I ran into Juan Garcia which, out there. Which version? Oh, wait, no, I shouldn't even say that. The only, There's only yeah, one back yeah, in the day. Yeah, it wasn't Ink. It should have been Venom. I don't know. I, it maybe it was a different genre. I don't know. But I ran into Juan Garcia, and then we started talking. He said he was working with World War III Records. And um, he said, hey, you want to do something? We're doing some compilations. So they wrote me a couple checks. So I was able to do... Um, a couple checks? Yeah, checks to do the recordings. They sent, oh, me, okay. they sent me checks so I could get the recordings done. From gotcha. And like uh, the guy from World War Three was Jerry Battle from Necrophagia from okay. the 80s. It was, it was his label. Uh, they're defunct now, but uh, I was able to get Insecticide on Let There Be Metal which was a tribute to ACDC. Okay. And then I was able to get Eyeball on um, The Wild Side, which was a tribute to Motley Crue. Now, this right here, this is in the center oh, of God, our damn. album that was made by Blower Records out of Mexico City. I physically had to do the family tree. And then I took it to a graphics guy, and he did it. And then you actually get to see the family tree. If you look up at the way top... You see where we started and who was in the band, and you can see like Predator and LSN and where they went to. That's our family tree. That's a huge family tree, dude. It stopped somewhere down around, what, 2001 down there? And I still think the ACDC and the Motley Crue albums are on there. Oh my gosh. Let me see here. What's the yeah, last? Yeah, it says... Is that about the yes, last entry? Yeah. And the tree still continues because now, you know... Oh, and the thing was... Okay, so the thing was called In, In For The Kill, a tribute to Motley Crue. Oh, In For The Kill. Uh, well, the actual album is uh, called and Wild And you did Bastard. That's a great... Oh, my God. That's, that's a great underrated... Uh, Isn't it a great song? Bastard? Yes. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it was Motley Crue when I first heard it. I know. It's a great song. It's awesome. Like, yeah, they don't... They're not really well known for it. No, they're like, not. They're I, known for Doctor Feel Good wanna... and Kickstart Your Heart. Um, remember, I told you when I was in high school, I had that buddy who had a buddy who his friend was in a senior, and he had a car, and uh -huh. we'd go to gigs. Yep. we went to a lot of gigs. We went to the Metal Massacres. I actually saw Motley Crue at the Whiskey, and I bought Too Fast for Love outside on the sidewalk on Leather Records, and I still have. I still have. I love my records, and I collect records. I'm the same way. Uh, when I asked uh, you the other night, hey man, can you play Michael Oldfield as an intro music? Right? You know, I went and saw that cat play like 15 years ago. Speaking and, of records, yeah, I don't like putting anything on top of uh, no records. Worries, no worries. Uh, I don't like seeing them warp. You I know, hear you. I hear you. You uh, got to take care of your records. You do. Dude. You do. You've seen my records. Yeah. I still buy records at this day when I can. Yeah, I just me dropped. Too. Uh, I just dropped like what 20 something bucks on a. That's uh, it. Yeah, I know. Well, it was a it was a double album from the Who, the Isle of Wight. Okay. I already have it on DVD, but I, I, I wanted the album for my collection. And um, getting back to what I said earlier. One of my about, favorite live shows ever. Which one? Uh, the live at uh, at the Isle. Oh, that's a great. That's a year after Woodstock. Yeah. It's a, yeah. <sighs> anyway. I, I went to the New Art Theater and I saw it when it came out into the movie theater. I went to the New Art and watched it. And I, I was rocking out in the theater. I actually ran into a buddy that I went to high school with who... Uh, who stutters a lot and he gets, uh -huh. he gets excited. He, <laughs> I ran into him. Yeah. So, um, but uh, I mentioned earlier about 
um, one of our albums for Dying World, which I didn't bring, which is still in cellophane, and the Who album I just bought, I probably won't take out of, out of cellophane. Um, Deceased was here a few years ago. Yeah, it was and, great, Phil. I saw yeah. that show at, at the joint. Oh, yeah, you were there? I was there. I, I was there, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a great show. Yeah. Dude. You know Arturo, the guy who videotapes? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. He was He's there. a good buddy of mine, too. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Arturo! Arturo rules, dude. What's yeah. that? Science. Oh, you're good. Don't okay. worry about it. Yeah. Well, um... King sells CDs. Remember, when I told you how he's the only guy next to Brian Singer has that has that much stuff can retain that much information. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was talking to King at the table, and you know he makes his extra money by selling CDs. So I got some money. So I'm gonna buy some CDs here. So I bought a few things. Uh, bought a uh, few things, and I picked up this one, and I looked at it, and it was Iron Maiden, uh, Japan, mm -hmm. and I was looking at it, and he's all, dude, that's a good one. He's all, Clive Bird does a drum solo. There's an interview on it. I said. Okay, you know what? Your recommendation's got to be good. So I bought it. Right. Uh, guess who died like two weeks later? <sighs> Clive Burr. So it is still in the cellophane. I haven't yet to open it. That's me. Right. Yeah, it's me. You should get another copy just because like... It's hard to find. I know, but you should still try and find another copy just to be able to play it. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Uh, that's, that's just me. I, when, I, when I'm long gone and someone has my collection, I'll let them do it. But that's just the way I am. Oh, Angela says we're Static X. It was Static, Static X. X. That was it. Thank you, Angelo. It was Static X, Slayer, and uh, Pantera. Thank you. And uh, I told the story about how you introduced, it, uh, introduced us at Normandale Park when we opened up for Vermin and the Upsetters and Hans Crypt. And I told about your your um, uh, Chinese robe with the dragon on it. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I got lost. And his white slippers. <laughs> Anyway, um, but yeah, here's so some, some, yeah, what is what is it that you have in here? Oh my gosh! Oh, you I like just, literally have everything. Well, um, I used to make my own stuff, and this is how we did things before the pre-computer, where I had to cut things out. Yeah, dude, like talk about, and then how you got to go somewhere to photocopy it and make yeah. tons of photos. Uh huh. That's yeah. how that's how I, I did it. But anyways, uh, a couple things I want to show you. It's here. still done that way. People still do it that way. You know, they they'll make you know go to the. Co the photocopy place and yeah. how do you think I made that? There you go. Yeah, see. You know, but um, here was a. I did a show with Gamma Side. Okay. And this is tactics. This was a, yeah. See Gaines's band. Yes, right. it was. Yeah, master plan, dude. What do you see wrong with this? Looks like it has too many letters. Yeah, for me. I spelt it wrong by accident. <laughs> I, I wrote to tactics. Um, this was the place I used to do gigs at. It was called Hollywood Live. You know what this place is? This, no. What is it now? This or is, well, this is on Hollywood Boulevard across okay. from Groman's Chinese Theater. This is where Jimmy Kimmel does his shows. Okay. I used to do shows there. Well, I, mean, I was trying to get it off the ground. I was trying to do something for the scene. So the guy gave me Monday, so I would do Metal Mondays. So we ended up playing with Oliver Magnum somewhere, and they were from Oklahoma. I brought Gamma Side in. Um, uh, did one with uh, Tactics. I did a Thrash Fest there, and here's Evil Dead and, and Beowulf. So I was able to, you know... Get people together to have a fa mm -hmm. fairly decent shows. Um, if you look at this picture right here, I think it is, uh, his face didn't come out very well, so I drew it on there. That's <laughs> this one. I had to draw his face. That's funny. But, and then this was uh, when I told you we went out after we had lost Rich Rowan from um, yes. from Predator, and the Deanish from 918V took over. And when we played with 918V, uh, this is what we called the tour. It was called the Summer In Talks. That's amazing. I guess I should show, we should oh. show everybody this, huh? We can see that. I don't have to blow it up or something. Yeah, but at least I can show it to yeah. them, you know, and see what what we're talking about. Yeah, get but them they're engaged. just uh, they're just flyers. Um, he's got he's got a lot of these, ladies and gentlemen. It's just odds and ends. Some of them are, are repeats, but and then this here, this was actually going to be the first original cover for the first album. It was done by Johnny Edwards out of Dallas. He was friends with a friend of ours uh, named Chris Thomas, who was in the band Scum of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was going to be the album, and it just it just never panned out. So we used it as uh, just you know t-shirts, uh, yeah, logos and flyers and things like you that. You can still you can still make it your album. I, I always wondered, I always wanted. I mean, I'm going to ask this anyway, so I'm just going to go for it now. What 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 happened with the 1990 record? You just recorded it, and then oh. and then it just yeah, we recorded that's it. it. Yeah, uh, nobody wanted to put it out. I, I mean, I know it was harder. In in those days or whatever, to put out a record, like you can't just like put out a record by yourself, and you had to have a label to 
fucking this is do an it. interesting story. When we got back from one of the demo tours, we had gotten a call from the Renaissance Records. Okay. And uh, they were going to open up, uh, I think Sepultura was still on the label at the time. Mm -hmm. They were going to open up a second, I guess I'll call it the division. division and yeah. it was called, uh, uh, it's, it's right over here somewhere. It, uh, not Colossal. Uh, I think it was Colossal. Uh, and we ran into some problems with them over um, what we wanted to do. They wanted us to use this guy, Drew Elliott. Okay. And remember, we were, had already been friends with Vermont, which was on their label. And they didn't have very highly good things to say about them. And we wanted to use our guy. And then when we went to go record the record, they said they would float us some extra money so we could get the drum doctor in there for, for the drummer, which they never did. And um, it seemed like we started getting on the back burner. And then things pretty much fizzled out right then and there. And there was a guy in Albuquerque who did a label called Acid Test. Okay. And he said he would put it out. I remember speaking with this dude at a phone booth in front of a hotel in Lawndale trying to get the album out. And he got kind of scared because it nothing was ever really done with Mm -hmm. with New Renaissance and he didn't want to get sued and he didn't want to say that they owned the rights and uh, the band just lost some steam and we never put it out and we didn't put it out till X uh, back in 2006 when we got a call from a couple guys out in Mexico City from Blower Records they called and they had the guts they had the uh, they had the uh, the drive and passion to, to the, the passion see it for the band to put it out and by then, what's New Renaissance going to do? Uh, a few years ago, we actually did a show with Hellion, and uh, I think they, Ann, I think Anne's the only original member of, of yes, that band. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we opened up pretty much. There was a couple bands before us, and we played. And uh, the next day, Gimme got got an email from her, and it said, "Good job, boys," which means a lot because. Uh, I never talked crap about New Renaissance. I'm bummed that they never... Uh, Gimme says it well. They put more effort into not putting out the album than putting it out. <laughs> okay. You know? I don't know how you do that. But... Uh, you do. You, uh, you, you stop returning phone calls. Uh, you, you know, you got, you got, you know, we, we did our part. We're promoting it everywhere we can. We're going out on our own dime in our own van, you know? We're making so, our own fires. The, was this on like a two-inch tape back in then? Two-inch you... magnetic tape. So we, how did you transfer it onto um, the digital thing for these labels to put them out? At the time that came around, I still have those master tapes. They sit for a long time. They get sticky if they're not really stored properly. You have to, There's a process where you bake it. And after you bake it, it's not you don't actually put it into an oven, but it's, it's a heat process. You get one last burn. And when, after we baked it, we, we recopied everything. Oh, and I, uh, I, have that, I have that two-inch tape sitting in my back room and on one of my shelves with the records. And then we were lucky enough to, you know, get on CD. And then everything else we did before, after that, like, uh, we did some stuff mm -hmm. uh, on ADAPT. Uh, we did some stuff. <clears throat> before we went on our first tour back in 88, we, and Gimme and I, remember that guy Scythe Mace I told you about? Mm -hmm. He wanted to get something going, so he wrote some songs, and it's, me on bass, okay. Gimme on guitar, and Greg Chikolovich from LSN, and this guy, Scythe Mace, on vocals. And I have a recording of that somewhere on a cassette tape in, in my box somewhere. And it, it, it's kind you of fuzzy. You should put that out too, dude. Yeah. You should have started your own record label and help bands out like ourselves and others. and just Because like, having a label is, is like huge, yeah. you but know, it's uh, not. like it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like... That's not my forte. I know. I would rather secure a place to say come here let's play that's what i want to do you know like how i do the podcast that's yeah like that's your I, deal yeah you know i'm not a very tech savvy guy <laughs> you know i've always kind of missed the edge on everything in in school uh i just missed the metric system they never did it uh, as when i was in high school uh the computer club had one computer and it it was pong mm -hmm. you know so but my, my point is, is i wish somebody out there would uh would take that initiative you hear that Tanner says someone out there open a record maybe, company. Maybe I'll, just have to, uh, maybe I'll just have to go to Eric who did the No Legacy vinyls and see, you know. Oh, there you go. Right? Mm -hmm. Just saying it helps a band tremendously if you actually have 
a label. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if it's your own. Well, yeah, uh, I've also, I, I think things have changed nowadays. Uh, you, you know, look at uh, someone who can record a whole album on Pro Tools in their living room and sell it on iTunes and whatnot and not have to have a warehouse full of 100,000 albums with jackets and sleeves. Yeah, it's just true. You know? That's what we do. Yeah. But, um, uh, where were we at with the new Renaissance? It just it, it fizzled out. I couldn't get it picked up on acid test, and we just lose steam. And then you know, uh, next thing you know, a year has gone by, two years have gone by. Uh, Gimme and I are helping 918V out doing that stuff. They put out an album with us uh, on Gags and Gore out of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, but we were playing 918V songs. They were great songs, but it, it wasn't not insecticide stuff. And then. Um, and then we come across Lewis, and then that's when we said, okay, we're going to do kind of the switcheroo. And like I said previously, mm-hmm. Eyeball's going to play insecticide songs. We're still the same guys. We still write the same way. And Eyeball is still insecticide. It's just that the name is different, but the material and the way we write are the same. So what is all what is all this? Oh, wow. let's get to Let's get to this. Let's oh, show wow. it to the camera if okay. we can. Uh, how do you want to do this? want to bring it up this way? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll, uh... All right. Oh, I forgot all about this. Show and tell. Yeah. So what are we looking at? I'm just going to bring this bad boy over to you guys all so right. you can see it. Oh, man. Let me go back a hair. See this guy right here? I brought I brought this guy right here. This thing works? You know what? I'm just going to hold it like this. What am, I, what am I looking at here? Well, uh, let me explain real quick. See this guy right here? This is Bill Bates. We okay. met him in Houston, uh, you know, back in the 80s. And he used to do a radio show called Sweet Nightmares with our good buddy Wes Weaver. Mm-hmm. And we had remained friends all this time. And he had called me. He he got sick and went to the hospital. As you can see, he's in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he got out, he started doing shows. And I think he knew he was getting near the end. So he had called me and said, hey, Sherman, I'm doing the Venom show. And I was thinking to myself, dang. He's going to call me. He's calling me to ask us to be to do the Venom show. And he said, you want to do the show the week after them? Uh, and it's like, and I, 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 I had a show offer, right? Yeah, yeah. So I told him at that time, I said, hey, man, you know, um, I haven't, we haven't jammed in like 18 months. I've talked to Gimme a handful of times. He's doing his thing. I'm doing, my, I'm doing the Sherman Tate thing now, right? Mm-hmm. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to call Gimme. So I called him up. I said, hey, man, you know, Bill called me. I go, He's doing the Venom show. And he says to me, so when do we play with Venom? And it's like, well, here's the thing. We got the show after Venom. And he said, okay. So I called Bill. I said, we're in. We're going to do it, right? So that means we need to start practicing now. Five, ten minutes later, Gimme calls me. And he says, hey, do you know Insecticide turns 30 next year? Wow. And I was all like, no, I, 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 I don't. So we spent 2016, this was the first show of the 2016, with our newest drummer, Jason Wallace. And uh, was we right around the time that we played with you guys, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, yours was more recently. I want to say it was like a couple years ago, dude. No, we just played like within the last year. At Malone's. 2017 or 2016? I thought it was 16. Um, I think it was 17. Okay. I, lose track. I wish I would have brought my logbook. I know, I lose track, yeah. dude. For some reason. That's why anyway, you, that's why you so gotta write this stuff thing down. Right here, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, can see it, is yeah. like pretty much a whole collage yeah. of the flyers and such. Well, what we did in uh, in 2016, we did our own show, mm-hmm. and uh, we filmed it because we wanted to do a documentary. Uh, the, the working title I have for it was is uh, "Cradle the Casket." Gimme's not too fond of that, but so what we did is we did a show uh, on our own. And we it asked Ellison to open up, and we did a storytellers. So instead of being rushed, after every song, we stopped and we talked about the songs, what we were doing at this time, this and that. And we weren't rushed. It was our own show, and we filmed it. I really, really loved it. So I made this to sit in the back as we were playing. So if you look at this picture here, this is Sean Hill. Okay. This is the second demo after the singer. Okay. This is over there behind the... the, uh, the uh, Downtown Studios, where Maggie Death and Albatore and everybody are at. I am now playing bass and singing. There's our drummer, Sean Hill, who's passed away, who had the heart problem in Chicago. This was a flyer that one of our buddies up in Portland did for us. Uh, not a flyer, a sticker. So if you can see it, ladies and gentlemen, right here. He's going to have to point at the camera right here. Okay, so, obviously, here, here, this is 
pretty much the original. Oh, back up a little bit back there. Yeah, see this thing right there. There you there go. You know. That's him, Sean Hill. We missed you, Sean. Well, there you go. This right here was uh, the paper we had to get when we crossed over into Tijuana when we opened up with opened up for XL. Okay. All right. So it's just something I just saved. It was in a file. I thought it'd be cool. Let me tell a quick story about XL. So we're doing the show. Uh -huh. You ever see the video for Thunderstruck with the plane at a tri-level yeah. place? This place was like that. The place held 999 people. Wow. So we're playing with XL. It's about 2 in the morning. It's time to go. And the promoter had all these Mexican Coke stores. So we grabbed what we could. And we get in the van. We got a ton of people. And I'm driving. <laughs> all right. We're driving up the 405. And I'm just cruising, man. I'm doing 55, 60. 405? From, from the oh, I'm seeing the, the 5. I'm like, wait yeah, a minute, you've already five. crossed into yeah. fucking... We're coming like, up to five. That's, that's a huge, that's like four hours right yeah. there, right? Well, it's about, it's, about, it's about two and a half, depending on how fast you yeah. drive from, from Mex San Diego, Mexico to Los Angeles. Even to here, it's like it's like three hours from, from Mexico. Yeah, about, uh, yeah. Anyway, give or take. So the okay. driving on the five. And I, I'm just cruising. Everyone's partying, right? Got the weed going, got, got the beer going, and this van. <laughs> I saw him come up in my rearview mirror because I could see the lights, right? Pass me. And it's like... There goes XL, right? We're driving, ha, 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 blah, blah, blah. I don't know, maybe 20 miles up the road, we see XL on the side of the road, standing outside with the cops all around him. Oh, no. And Can we just speed? drove by. Nah, just drove by. It's like, just like waving uh -huh. like this? Oh, God. <laughs> they never passed me. I never saw them again. Oh, no. Now, here's a show that we did with Viking. Okay. This show right here, this is the only show... That eyeball, I mean, insecticide. What, ever year, did. what year was this? That's 1986. Okay. May 1986. You know what's weird? No one put years no, on it. No, this anymore. doesn't have a 1980. That's why I asked. Yeah, why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. You notice no one puts dates on the flyers? Not anymore. No. They, they, I don't think they ever have those. No, look at this one. Like, uh, this, is, this is probably 1986. I put the flyers on this one. I mean, the date on this one. We went there for, for two days. So I, I, I think it's out. always important to put, put the year, you know? Like this, okay, so just a quick story. We played with... Um, oh, really? A band, this this is Valor. They're, uh -huh. they, um, they're no, they no longer exist. Oh, bummer. Um, they, they now are... A couple members are in a band called Dark uh, Ale. Um, anyway, interesting name. Yeah. I like that. So uh, they like beer, obviously. Okay. Um, <laughs> we play, anyway, we played with these guys at a place called Hoagie Bar Michaels, and there was a oh, round... Oh. It was around, or something, right? Yeah, it's still it's still it's still Newport, um, but yeah, Newport. they don't uh, they don't do metal shows sadly anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, our point is, is this was around the time where we first started. Okay, well, let's do so that. It's funny right that here. it's funny that you have this okay. particular flyer. All right. Um, and so obviously this show. Oh, uh, this was in Arizona. I just liked it because it was big. Yeah. You know? uh, it's it's nice that a guy like this can make something to say, hey, you know, insecticide threats from California. And here's so here's a ticket right from. Here. It's, uh, that's from um, uh, Portland, Oregon. Yeah, Dead Conspiracy. Uh -huh. good guy. They're good friends uh -huh. of the show. And, okay. And myself. Will you tell them I said hi? I will. Now, what I was getting about, about this show here is mm -hmm. uh, this was the only time Insecticide ever did pre-sale. Okay. Pay to play. I refuse to do that. I have better things to do with my money. Um, I, I will never do that. And if I ever do, you slap me silly. Because as a promoter and do my nationwide attractions, I will never make a band do that. You have better things to do with your money than to, to worry about making me money because I got to pay somebody else. If I don't think you're going to draw someone, you're not playing. Right. That's bring good, me some people. That's a good, I'm uh, going to secure the venue. I'm going to treat you like a rock star. You bring me some people. Right. I think that's fair. I think it is too, my man. And I always tell everybody too, you bring me a receipt for like some flyers that you did where I know you did some networking for like 10, 12 bucks. I'll give you money that night. Don't be bringing me a Receipt from Kinkles for seventy five bucks. And I look at my tally sheet. And you brought in three people. I'm not giving you the money. But you, I look at my tally sheet. and I see that you brought 25, 30 people, and you give me a receipt for supplies for ten bucks. There you go. Thank you for promoting. Anyways, here we are in Hugh in Houston at the Axiom, and this is Deanish on drums. Okay. This picture doesn't he look like Rudolph Shanker? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. A little bit. This is you, actually, look like, you look like lips from Anvil, though, right, in this picture. I don't know okay. if that's a compliment. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. No, uh, you know, <laughs> I've been told I look like Ronnie James Dio and Kurt Cameron and Tom Araya. Okay. I usually get Chuck and Ted Nugent combined, so I... I feel yes, like I... Like, okay. Okay, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And Tommy Shaw. Oh, yeah, and Tommy yeah, Shaw. Yeah. Now, now Tommy yeah. Shaw, there's you. Yeah, there you so. go. Um, this picture right here is... These are two different pictures. I just taped them together. And made is that what copy. that is? Yeah, because... 
His didn't turn out good, so I cut him, and there was only one that I could find that we were about the same size. Okay. This was all cut and paste back then. Man, if you would have, you would have, you could have just lied to me. I mean, I believe oh. that, that looks like. No, no, two different pictures. Here's the mighty mega MX machine mm -hmm. uh, in Houston at the Axiom right here. And then here's our first demo cover with the singer. Okay, I'm going to show this to the audience here. This is what this looks like right here, if you can see it. Right there. I'm not doing a very good job of trying, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway. And then uh, this is a picture of our gear when we were up in uh, Toronto, Canada, playing with MX Machine at a different show. That's where it's pointing at. Okay. And uh, this is our uh, drummer that came in after Blower Records, uh, Alex Ron. He's from the band Ghetto Death. Oh my god, I should just turn on the fucking light ages and, ago. And then here's uh, the first album that the cover that should have been with Johnny Edwards. Mm -hmm. uh, here's one of my gigs here. You see Nationwide Attraction. It's pretty much all of his family tree in one fly flyer. Yeah. Well, except, except us. But, yeah. There so, you go, 2012. Uh-huh. That, uh, that was my first Metal Summit. Then I did Metal Summit 2. I did Metal Summit 3. I, I would like to do Metal Summit 4. You should. Sometimes I just have to secure a place. Well, I'm actually looking at a place by my, by my house called Alpine Village. It's okay. big, and I, if I get some big band, give me an hour thing. It'd be nice to get a big band on there, like St. Vitus, and what's it going to cost me? Right. That's what it comes down to. But, you know, if I could do something like uh, 15 bands, and each mm -hmm. band can bring, you know, 30 people, we're all going to have is, a good time. This is amazing, dude. It's good that you kept this stuff, dude. Well, it's just one of those things. And then you I... You had to, dude. You had to... I brought this here, too. Sure, this... Show the audience, man. Let's see here. So this is one we of my, made one of my uh, yeah we made this for the 30 year anniversary. So if you see it says uh, insecticide established 1986, 30 effing years of mega thrash, and it's just and if you look right in the middle, see the maggots? It's actually in an eye for insecticide. Okay. Yes, it is. If you can. And then if you if you ever looked at our shirt that we made for this, it was in a pyramid. Mm -hmm. The top of the pyramid was an eyeball. How do you like that as coincidence? That is that's awesome, dude. And then uh, it's actually the eyeball from the dollar bill for money. And then the <laughs> slogan on the on the bottom of the shirt was uh, "No money, no fame, no shit." We never made any money. Uh, we, right. I guess you could say we're famous, but we're not. But we didn't take any shit because we didn't take any shit. Maybe uh, we would have had an album out or something. Um, it was one of those things. Like you know, it, it is. It's it's our way or the highway. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's I a double edged sword. Yes. I, I got a lot to be thankful with this band. You know, I got yes, a lot. Do, I got a lot of good friends. I got a lot of good memories. Uh, and you're still making more. Yeah, until this yeah, day, yeah. You know, but um, on Texas, I gave me the opportunity to do things that I I couldn't do on my own. You know, I, I'm standing with Gimme, my best friend, at in Niagara Falls at two o'clock in the morning, crossing the border and we're filling the spray. Uh huh. How lucky am I that I can say I did that with my best friend in a traveling heavy metal band? You know, I remember being in St. Louis and looking up at the arch and saying. Hey, I, I saw a picture of Iron Maiden doing this. I'm here too. You know what separates bands like that from you and I? It's just the money. We do the same gigs, right? We may play in front business, of 50 dude. people. We play in front of 50 people. They play in front of 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, they take uh, buses and, 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 and planes. Uh, we have to rent a van or a car. This and that. They stay at the five-star hotels. Uh, we stay at the Motel 6s or on someone's living room. Right. It's the same sort of lifestyle. It's just the money separates us. Yeah, but you know we're still doing the same thing. Absolutely, so. I, yes, I agree. Well, it's, take me take me to the end to of, the end uh, of your uh, of your career. So you, you I mean uh, there is no beginning, there is no end. Yeah, well, uh, to to where we are currently in two thousand eighteen. Two thousand eighteen. Okay, well, after we came off the uh, celebrating thirty years, uh, we did a handful of shows okay. last year, and you were on one of the bills with Silent Scream and things. I like apologize that. in advance for not knowing the year or anything, but none none needed. You know what? We're, I remember you and Cerebrus were all, and, and us were on the same bill, and uh -huh. then we have a picture, obviously, of all uh -huh. of uh, us singers. Oh yeah, that's right. Singers, huh? yeah. if you want to call us singers, yeah. right? Well, I always tell, I always tell people, like I told you earlier, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm the bass player in the band by the by default. I'm the singer of the band. I'm not a trained singer. I took chorus in high school, uh, and I sang with a lot of good people in that class. So I have a, I, I have a basic ear, and I can hit pitches and things like that, but. Am I a singer? No. Do I know my limitations? Yes. Uh, totally. And but the thing too is, is like I, I could never. I, me personally, I could never find a singer that did what I wanted the band to to do. Do you so know what I mean? So you have to do it. So I have to do it, right? So it's like I needed somebody to do this and this. I can't tell them what to do. Like I physically have to do it. Yeah. I, yes. So, yes, you do. 
You know, uh, it is what it is, right? We couldn't get a bass player to play the way we wanted him to play. So you play we bass? Wanted, yeah. You know, thanks to breaking my thumb, but um, at least that's all you broke, dude. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I might, I might have lost a few marbles, but. Um, and then uh, last year we did a handful of shows, mm -hmm. and then we got a couple shows coming up. Uh, yeah, tell this year. tell the uh, our, our our listeners about right. it, dude. Well, on um, March twenty fourth, we're going to be playing with Anger's Art. Oh, that's right. I'm going to be at the show. Oh, you are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, when we do medium it, oh, we may not have enough time for that, but we'll do Here a shout the out to you, ladies and gentlemen. This that should be a good show. This is happening. Uh, oh, I think this is March twenty fourth, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Saturday, Saturday, uh, March twenty fourth, two thousand eighteen. With uh, Anger's Art, Heretic, obviously, um, and Insecticide, Power Throne, mm -hmm. Nightmare. Uh, let's see. With this is a uh, war. What is this? Warhog. Warhog, and then uh, man. And then something I can't uh, figure yeah, out. Yeah, I, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Man, I'm not too good at reading band logos no. anymore. You know, I used to have like a keen eye yeah. and then just nothing. No, it's tough, man. It's tough, especially when uh, the, the black metal stuff is like, you should miss so many cobwebs or drips or whatnot. And uh, the brutal death metal scene, mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's some, some you know, some logos that are very it's, it's, it's like, misunderstood. It's like code or, 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 or uh, it, it's encrypted. Um, and then um, a week after that, we were playing at a place in Torrance mm -hmm. with uh, a great cover band from the South Bay. They're called Rock Shop. We're actually getting an hour that night, so we're not going to be rushed. Rock Shop. Wait a minute. Doesn't Stu from uh, yes. Insecticide? Because yeah. I know Andrew from... was telling me about Rock Shop on yeah. last, uh, last week or whatever. Great band. They play great songs. They're not your typical bar band, but they're just great. So we're going to be playing with them. We get an hour. We're not going to be rushed, so we'll be able to uh, breathe a little bit. And then uh, April, we're, we got this show here with the guy who used to be in trans metal. Okay, I'm going to show the audience this yes, to you. Yes, please. please. So what is it that, that uh, we are looking at right here? That is the flyer for the gig for Bricks Lounge Bar in Maywood, California, which is right behind the rehearsal studio we used to be at. Uh, we actually played there about... Uh, about nine months ago and what was really really cool about that gig mm -hmm. was it felt like we had if we would have never done another gig after that i'm i'm good because <laughs> it was like a full circle we started rehearsing right around the corner those pictures you saw of sean and us mm -hmm. are all right there and here we are playing right here um you know i i know it's going to end someday i don't know how many shows we have left uh, I'm sure if maybe six years from now we get a call from someone there's a really, really good show, I'm sure we'll do it. Uh, Got to knock off the cobwebs. Well, you're, if, you are a, a hard man to track down, I can tell you that. Oh, like, really? I, I always thought I was easy to find. No. No, like I had to go through like your band's Facebook or whatever just to find you. So, All right. Obviously, I'm glad you're here, but definitely, you know, if uh, if you could do the gig and you're easier to, to find, I'm sure you'll get you yeah. know, more and more gigs. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it comes down to it has, it has to be a good gig it has to be something that's uh, logistically possible and if it is going to be somewhere far away uh, we got to make sure that the tickets are included somehow and is there going to be a back line there and whatnot you know I love the lifestyle if you have to sit in the van and drive I'm down but it doesn't doesn't work for everybody in the, in the band and uh, you know if and when it comes to that day when you know we do not play anymore you know I'm I'll probably work on my little solo thing, or I go to the next step in my life, which is, you know, I, I, I'll enjoy my life, uh, and I run a studio. I, you know, I can set up ten bands a night, so I'm like a roadie. Yeah, and you're you're still going to be yeah. supporting metal because that's what you like. And I to would do. like to take nationwide trash a little further. I always talked about maybe moving to Albuquerque and getting a little place on the hill, and then getting a little. Uh, club venue across the street from university right there on the main drag i can be open almost 24 hours get a camera system in there get some college kid to work for me get a little uh get a little uh, stage in the back and you know what and whenever you come from the east coast you're going to take the 10 or the 40 and hopefully word gets around that hey there was a guy back in the 80s and 90s he was in this band he's got a club and you know what he pays you you know is that the next evolution of, of, of my life i don't know i take it day by day but uh you know, I'm, I'm just so thankful that I, I've had my best friend to be in a band with me, and to do the things I've done, to meet the people I, I've met, people such as yourself and people who carry the torch. You know, if I had a hat, I would take it off to you. We are honored that you can think of insecticides. Oh, wow. You know, when I read the things she, she sent me, I was, I'm all, <laughs> I, I go, wow. I was like, legendary career? It's like, oh, wow. You know, Tanner, it's just me. 
but but thank you. I, I appreciate that. Dude, you've worked you've you worked your ass me. off. You you've worked me. your ass off though, and you deserve it. That's the thing. Is that's the whole point to the show. I said it obviously countless times, but you know, it's to showcase those people that have put in the work and just never got recognized for it. You know, yeah. hopefully this will shine some light on your career. Yeah. Not only for you know myself, but you know for you as well. Well, I am a staunch supporter of, of, of this podcast from now on. You know, if I, if I know I got bands coming through town, I, I'll call you. Hey, Just hey, remember, hey. I only interview one. It's only it's a one on one conversation. Oh, so okay. There's no right. like, there's no. Then I'll invite you to the shows. But Ma- California would be the one that me and uh, Benny over here, who's fucking dying on the floor. <laughs> okay, from the L. Yeah. So we do a podcast called Metalifornia Still. It's still, uh, it's you know. Really. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, once we get this whole situation figured out, it will be back. But we'll interview bands. Okay. But f- f- my podcast is just a one-on-one because yeah. it's it's inside I, the actor studio. Yeah. Band. No, I can I get I can get what I what I need to get from you. Okay. If I have other people interrupting all the time, it doesn't work. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, I got a quick story for you. Sure. Uh, let's end it. Let's end it on a high note, man. Okay. Well, it's it's kind of just a comical story. Uh, back in the '80s, before we went on our first tour, uh, mm-hmm. Gimme and I were in the uh, downtown rehearsal studios, and Megadeth was a couple doors down from us. Okay, Killing Is My Business wasn't even out, and you know, we we never thought that bands like Slayer, Anthrax, and stuff would be be selling out Yankee Stadium. You know, we never. You know, we didn't have a blueprint back then. We just did what we wanted to do. Nowadays, bands say, "Oh, I want to sound like that. I want to do this." Back then, we just we just did what we did. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Danny from uh, Avatar telling me he's all he's all. We had a song called Buzz, and he's all, "You guys just sound punk rock, but we're metalists." Like, well, you know, we we were making fun of that particular song a few years ago because we were saying, "Well, that was a blast beat before a blast beat was a blast beat." We just did what we did. But uh, so, Gimme and I, we were looking for amps, and. Uh, Dave Mustaine was selling his amps. So he came down into his... Probably needed some heroin money uh, or yeah, something. About that time, yes. Oh, yes, man. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely Terrible a joke. But he had come into our... Well, actually, one uh, evening, Gar, Gar and I were in the restroom together, uh, dropping turds, talking to each other through the, really? through, through the stall wall. Yeah. And we've lost him, too. Just like we lost Don. And, uh, oh, I also wanted to mention, uh, we lost uh, our good friend here, Bill Bates, too. So uh, he's also been the media man. And on nights, maybe at the crest, media man's going to go to you, buddy. And um, so anyway, I'm honored, dude. I'm, I'm glad we can do it for you. You know what? You are media man to me, you know. Um, you're going to have to listen to the words. But anyways, um, so Dave Mustaine comes into our room. And he's trying to sell when us. You, when you're dropping turds in the in the toilet with Gar, just... uh, around the same time, around the same time. <laughs> no. So he comes in our room, and we're sitting there, and, and he's trying to sell us these amps because we were looking for amps. And uh, nowadays, uh, impedance switches are just the little click switches. Mm-hmm. But back then, the old Marshalls, there was like a, a prong you had to pull out and rotate, and it had pins on it to get the right ohms, eight ohms, sixteen ohms, whatever. So he brought these amps in, and then I noticed that. Like, they were gone. And I said, hey, well, what do you do about the ohms here? And he said, oh, yeah, well, check this out. He said, what you got to do is you got to get a hanger and cut some of the metal off and bend it. And you stick them in there, and that uh, does your impedance for you. And it's like, right then right then, there, it's like, uh, we're not buying these amps. We didn't say that to him right down the spot. But, you know, we gave each other the eye. We're not buying so these funny. amps. So funny. And then he becomes, like, one of the biggest. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Well, you know what? Like I said, back then, we didn't, we didn't have a clue where this was going. We were just living a lifestyle and doing what we love, uh, you know, uh, aspiring to be Black Sabbath was was maybe maybe the goal in the long run. I never thought that man like that could make a career out of it. You know, there was no no Hall of Fame back then, you know. I remember oh, yeah. meeting Ronnie James Deal once at, at a little club, and he came out and did Man on the Silver Mountain. There was maybe fifteen of us in there, and he played with Jakey Lee. Oh man. That would have been an awesome, awesome gig to go to too. Dude. That was about 1981, 82. Uh, he had just left Sabbath after the uh, Mob Rules album. Okay. And he was at a little place, big as this bar, playing. Came in, very gracious afterwards. But those are things you learn from people. It's how, how to be gracious. It's amazing, don't you think? Yeah, and I, I, all I can, all I can do to pay homage to them is is uh, carry the torch of yeah, that dude. Carry the torch and, and and to be like them. That's that's my ultimate goal as well. So. Sherman, thank you so much, seriously, for, for the coming. The pleasure on. has been mine. Please I will, come I will, on again. I will cherish this date for a long, long time, and I'm actually going to log it in my book I'm, with the gigs because this is kind of a gig. I'm honored, yeah. dude. Maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll take the video and I'll burn DVD for you. So oh, you could you your, please? 
for your collection, you know. Yes. I've, I've figured out how to do this. You can actually, you know, do right. this with uh, with programs and stuff. You can take Facebook Live videos and and uh, okay put it on a DVD. So that's Thank what I'll you, do for you. And I'm going to look back and say, how many times did I stumble? How many times did I stutter? Uh, how many times did I say, you know, uh, how many times how, did I say, How many uh, times I interrupted you? No, no. You, you, I told you on the text, <laughs> reel me in because I was going to ramble. And, you know, there are, there are so many stories and so much so many things I would like I know, to see. I you know you got to come on, on like California when we do it and just, right. just hang, bring Gimme. Okay. You know we're goofballs. You know me and Benny are, <laughs> are, are huge assholes and ben, goofballs. I know Ben does LSD. Yeah, so. All righty, my friend. Well, thanks so much. Seriously, Thank you, man. man. I hope everyone tuned in. Where, where can people find you? You can find me. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't do the Facebook thing, but my true friends have my phone number and they call know, me, wish to, me happy you birthday. You have to go through your, your friends just to yeah. reach it. That's what I, my point was. All right. Go to uh, anything, uh, Google, Insecticide, Thrash Band, and anything on computer, Gimme will take care of. So if you're looking for me, call him and he'll call me. Make sure to pick this up too because I'm, I'm going to get a copy literally like right after this broadcast. I hope you can find it. Oh, I have. I've already located it. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Dude, you're All the man. Right. Episode 4 out. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. All right? Peace. Episode 4, battle.